Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the...
Okay, members, and uh, we resume our proceedings on the second stage of the Integrated Education Bill. I go to Iram Sir Justin McNulty on Kanchi. I now call Justin McNulty to speak. As a member of the Education Committee, I am happy to be able to contribute to today's debate, and I thank the member, Ms Armstrong, for bringing forward her bill. We in the SDLP are proudly committed to vibrance, diversity, inclusion and pluralism in our education system and in our society. Given that integrated education has existed in the North for more than 30 years, it is surprising that fewer than 1 in 10 of our, our young people are educated in an integrated setting. Therefore, it is understandable the, mo the motivation behind this bill being brought forward to this Assembly and this Executive seeking to enhance and strengthen our integrated education sector. All too often in this place we focus on traditional community fault lines and on what divides us. The simple fact is our young people are light years ahead of us when it comes to breaking down the barriers of the past and facilitating a truly shared society. In saying that, the current state of play in our education system does not reflect the progressive and outward-looking worldview of our young people. Continuing to segregate, segregate our children and our communities, particularly on the basis of religious background, only serves to perpetuate the division of the past, divisions of the past and impedes the progress that our, our society so desperately needs. In contemplating the potential associated with this bill today, I found my mind pondering the possibilities that could, could flow from a more integrated education system. How cathartic and inspiring it would be to see the captain of the Royal School in Armagh hoisting the Macquarie Cup, or the Abbey Grammar School in Newry mounting the bid for the, school's cup, for the Senior School's Cup. Our society has evolved enormously in recent years as time our education system reflected that also. It would be remiss of me today not to pay tribute to the incredible work being done by schools in my own constituency. Newry and Armagh boast some of the, most, the highest ranked secondary education institutions in the North, where diversity and sporting programs have offered opportunities for engagement between young people from divergent backgrounds. In addition to that, the four grammar schools in Newry all have a disproportionately high number of students in receipt of free school meals, which speaks to socio-economic diversity in the student bodies of these schools. On that basis, I would suggest that there are many lessons that can be learned from the schools in my constituency in the context of academic excellence, community inclusion and diversity in socio-economic backgrounds. We cannot and should not pursue a steamroller approach to this issue. We need to engage with relevant stakeholders strategically and with a listening ear. With this in mind, as this bill progresses through committee, I will be advocating for robust engagement with relevant stakeholders at all levels in the sector as well as an approach which pursues a strategy of levelling up and one which seeks to emulate the successes of high-performing schools. There are aspects of the Bill that do need clarified. Many of those have already been mentioned. I'm not going to go through them all individually again. But one overarching question I have is while there are mentions of monitoring targets, benchmarks throughout this document, this Bill, I want to know how do we measure success? How do we measure success for the education of our young people? As I said at the outset, I and my party are energetically committed to a fully inclusive education system which reflects our broader society and therefore I will be supporting this bill in principle. There are, there are issues in the bill which need to be worked out, as I said, and for my part I will be fighting to ensure that, that the good work of the schools across my own constituency and beyond are held up as examples of best practice. To that end, I wish to echo what my party colleague, Daniel McCrossan, has said. I do not believe that abandoning our faith-based schools or our Irish medium sector serves any of our young people. My own experience in St Malachy's in Camlock and the Abbey in Newry, faith-based schools provided me with an early exposure to young people from other backgrounds. I can fondly recall in the Abbey a collaborative project with Newry High School at the Newry Hockey Pitch where we played a cross-community sports match. First half, we played a game of hockey. Second half, we played a game of Gaelic football. At the hockey, I was useless and quite good at the Gaelic football. Um, but I, I can never forget the joy that brought to us. 
the joy, the joy that brought to all involved, coaches, teachers, uh, participants, you know, the people, the players, it was just a really joyous occasion. And it was my first experience of interacting with a number of children from a different faith and different background. And as I said, woe well, did we enjoy it. I have to thank Mr. Aidan O'Rourke, our rookie, for giving us that experience. I do appreciate, though, that this early years grinding and exposure isn't a common experience across the board. Recently, a former teammate of mine spoke about his own experience of schooling. He shared that he hadn't met a Protestant until the final years of his second, secondary education when he started attending school in Armagh City. To my mind, this reaffirms the need to take a strategic and tailored approach, recognising that there are very, very valuable lessons to be learned from the many schools across the North that have been quietly and conscientiously doing the heavy lifting on inclusive education for many years. Back to my own school. I sat beside Lawrence Wong from Malaysia. Davy Lowe from Hong Kong was my class also. So our school, before ahead of its time, was integrating education to the best it could. We had a Protestant teacher with Protestants in the school. So there was that integration in the Abbey and Uri. We need to see more of it. So there is a lot worth protecting and emulating within schools now. This bill is a start. And forgive me for mixing my metaphors, it gets a shovel under a very important issue, but we will need to drill down into the nuts and bolts. And there are a lot of nuts and bolts that need to be drilled down, to, down into. Creating the framework for an integrated education system is a task which belongs to us all, and I look forward to working with colleagues from all parties to further scrutinising this bill as it passes through the committee stage. This must be got right. Okay, um, I now call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. It's a privilege to speak as a Lands Party Education spokesperson in support of the principles of this Integrated Education Bill, as proposed by my colleague Alliance Integrated Education spokesperson, Kelly Armstrong, MLA. Can I, at the outside, outset, recognise the extent of the consultation undertaken by Kelly Armstrong on this bill? It's my understanding that a 12-week consultation was undertaken on the bill with over 800 responses received and multiple key stakeholders engaged, such as the CSSC and CCMS. Building a united community has been a key mission of the Alliance Party since our foundation. The Alliance vision for education is an integrated and sustainable system that delivers equal opportunity for all children to develop their own unique personality, talent and ability together. There are persuasive rights good relations, educational and economic imperatives for integrating education in Northern Ireland, and the time for reform is now. I must admit, Deputy Speaker, I've been somewhat surprised by the level of hostility expressed by some members in relation to children learning together today, and I regret that more of them are no longer present in the chamber to engage directly with them, given how much they had to say about me when they were here. Um, However, when I listen to some of the contributions from some members today, dancing on the heads of pins to justify their position in relation to educating children together, I hear the words of Martin Luther King Jr. ringing in my ears. When he was told by the establishment to slow down on his dream for children learning together, he stated clearly in his response, that this is no time to engage in delay. And perhaps most powerfully, he stated clearly that it was no time to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. King's colleague, Representative John Lewis, also frequently encouraged supporters of integration to do all that they could to get in the way. We will not be intimidated or misrepresented from getting in the way on behalf of all children and young people in Northern Ireland. This bill presents every party, every member in this assembly to demonstrate actual support for an integrated approach to education, the like of which has been recommended for decades and is supported by people across the community in Northern Ireland and beyond. The International Peace Accord and this jurisdiction's founding document, the Good Friday or Belfast Agreement stated clearly that integrated education is essential to reconciliation and the promotion of tolerance at every level of our society. 
in 1998. The public response to the cohesion, sharing and integration strategy consultation was clear in support of integrated education. Yet the Executive Office declined to include provision for integrated education in the final Together Building a United Community strategy developed from this consultation in 2013. The Fresh Start panel report on the disbandment of paramilitary groups in Northern Ireland, the disbandment of paramilitarism in Northern Ireland, the disbandment of paramilitarism in Northern Ireland recommends that the Executive set ambitious targets to measurably reduce segregation in education as quickly as possible in 2016. A poll on education in 2018 found that good educational standards, and I'm glad I can agree with Mervyn's story on something, um, a poll on education in 2018 found that good educational standards are by far the most important factor to many people when choosing a school. But that was followed closely by a desire for children to be educated together. Two thirds of respondents supported their school becoming officially an integrated school. Seems to fly in the face of some of the comments that are being made here today, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Overall view was that political leaders have done little or nothing. Uh, this is the actual wording of, of, the, uh, of the poll, apologies. Um, have done little or nothing to facilitate and encourage integrated education. 60% of respondents felt politicians actually hold up the accessibility of integrated education. The Ulster University Economic Policy Centre has also established that there is a significant financial cost of separation in our education system, which could be up to £90 million per year. That is in the context of the Department of Education itself stating that our education system is in financial crisis. Despite all of the above, Deputy Speaker, the Executive Office Good Relation Indicators for 2018-19 found that 21% of first preference applications to post-primary integrated schools did not result in admission. 21%. This is a significant increase of 3% compared to the proportion of first preference applications to post-primary integrated schools that did not result in admission in 2017-18. It's actually getting worse. Since 2013-14, there's been a significant increase in the percentage of first preference applications to post-primary integrated schools that do not result in admissions, an increase of 11 percentage points. This represents an increasing oversubscription to post-primary integrated schools. A lot has been made, Deputy Speaker, of parental choice. In my own constituency of East Belfast, poll results have found that a majority of parents, approximately 76%, support their school becoming integrated. While parents felt that good educational standards are the most important factor, as I mentioned, when choosing a school, Reflecting a particular faith background was viewed as the least important factor. The majority were also in favour of a joined-up approach to future planning for education and housing to help improve good relations in our society, which is indeed one of the clauses in, contained in the Bill. Deputy Speaker, the Department of Education commissioned an independent review of integrated education. This independent review reported, I believe, in 2016, and it recommended that the Department of Education review the existing legal definition of integrated education to ensure that it is appropriate for the 21st century, particularly in light of Northern Ireland's changing demographic and increasing diversity. It recommended that the Department of Education bring forward legislation to place a duty on the Department of Education and the Education Authority and the PAR and all other arm's length bodies to encourage, facilitate and promote integrated education. That's the Department of Education's independent review. That the new legislation should include a requirement to report to the Assembly at intervals of not more than two years on the implementation of the statutory duty to encourage, facilitate and promote integrated education and that the Department of Education should review the religious balance criteria for integrated schools 
to take greater account of our more diverse society, regional and local demographics, including the balance of the community in which a school is located. It also recommended that the EA should proactively plan, set objectives for and monitor progress towards increasing the places available in integrated schools. That all development proposals for closures and amalgamations of existing schools should be required to demonstrate in the case for change that they have given consideration to a sustainable, integrated, jointly managed or shared solution. I think there are 40 odd recommendations in total, Deputy Speaker, but you probably get the idea of what it says. This bill is consistent with a lot of those recommendations contained in the Department of Education commissioned independent review, the report of which was published, I believe, by the former Minister of Education, Peter Weir. Deputy Speaker, this bill presents every party and member in this assembly to demonstrate actual support for an integrated approach to education, implementation of a Department of Education independent review on integrated education, and reform the like of which has been recommended for decades and is supported by people across the community in Northern Ireland and beyond. I sincerely hope this... Do you want me to give way? Yeah, go ahead. Member for kindly giving way. I recognise the important point the member has said about the importance of the independent review of education. With that said, why then has his party brought forward this bill at this stage and not waited for the independent review? The question has been asked a number of times and answered. I'm making reference to an independent review of integrated education that reported in 2016. Five years on, I think it's entirely legitimate to seek to have proper implementation of those recommendations, notwithstanding the need for wide-ranging reforms across education, which hopefully the independent review of education in its entirety will also recommend. In closing, yeah, happy to give way. Yeah. I'm grateful uh, to the member, and I have been listening to the debate outside. When the member talks about the fundamental review of education and the recommendations that come from that, everyone obviously is committed to that. Clause 7 of this bill will create circumstances where every single new school in Northern Ireland opened belongs to one sector. How does that reality of what this law would do in practice, how does that reflect the need for a wide-ranging reform of all education? I thank the member for his question again. That is a question that has been raised. The clause obviously refers to a presumption, unless there will be special circumstances. So I, um, the, I'm sure the proposer of the bill will refer to that in a bit more detail when given the opportunity to do so. In closing, yeah, I'm, I'm almost closed here, but go ahead. I thank the member for his uh, generosity. <laughs> Of spirit in relation. The members made obviously reference on a number of occasions to the 2016-2017 uh, um, independent review of integrated education. Obviously, within those 40 recommendations, I know I think the minister will be dealing with a number of those that, that haven't as yet been implemented and where they'll be looked at, at least in, in relation to that. But in terms of a number of the recommendations were recommended, but it's also the case that the integrated sector itself did not actually accept all the recommendations and rejected some of those 40. Okay, thank the member for that intervention and piece of information. Um, there are also a, a wide range of recommendations that it, it does support and wish to see implemented um, also. Uh, Deputy Speaker, that, that was really me bringing my remarks to a close. I, I sincerely hope that the House does take this opportunity to support a more integrated approach to education and allow this bill to pass um, for more detailed scrutiny at committee stage. Thank you. And I call Peter Weir. Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, probably it comes no great surprise that um, I've, down the years, have visited quite a lot of integrated schools. I've seen the excellent work that has been done uh, within integrated schools, um, and I suppose, if you like, those, those school visits are often, I'm sure, the Minister will agree, is actually the best part of the job, uh, seeing sort of um, young people, particularly the, the enthusiasm. But I've also visited, as well as those excellent integrated schools, schools across the entire sectors, um, be it sort of. Uh, Irish medium, uh, maintained schools, controlled schools, where also there's an excellent delivery that's there. I, I also fully respect the desire of parents when they wish to see um, a school, for instance, transformed into an, an integrated school. That is entirely their right, and it's one that has been supported down the years. I think even in the last 
six months, um, we've seen a situation where there's been, I think, four development proposals that have been signed off on um, with a, a transformation to an integrated status, largely borne out by um, parental demand on those, on those occasions, including, I think, for the first time ever, a Catholic maintained school transforming an integrated school. And I think it is perfectly right for parents to express that opinion, for that to be facilitated and encouraged uh, through the department, and it to be responded to. But also I have to say, and I think there is a common theme that, that probably the biggest single thing that parents are looking for when they look at the school is the quality of the education rather than um, the exact sort of sectoral um, specificity of the, the school. But if we are to respect those who seek uh, to have their school as an integrated school, we should also fully respect uh, the rights of those who wish to make other choices, be it a faith-based maintained school, be it a controlled school, be it, like Mr O'Dowd, um, a school which um, teaches in Irish medium, be it a school at, at post-primary level is either selective or non-selective, be it, uh, and I know Mr Story is no longer with us, be it an independent Christian school, or indeed um, there are some within our system who choose uh, a home elective uh, situation where their, their children are taught at home. It, it strikes me that we should um, respect all of that. And I think if we are to value particularly integrated education, uh, I have to say, looking at this bill, I see four areas, and I'm not going to reiterate everything that's been said um, so far, where I think that in terms of content, there are fundamental flaws um, in relation to it. I'm not going to go over the issues around consultation, which have been and process issues, but looking at the, the strengths of the bill itself, firstly, there are strategic considerations. It is undoubtedly the case, um, as the, the old adage of, of, I think, someone who was stopped uh, somewhere and asked for direction said, well, I wouldn't have started from here in the first place. Undoubtedly, if we were to start with a completely blank page in terms of education, would we have reached precisely the layout, the configuration of a school's estate, for example, that was there. But we do need to actually take on board where we are. We have a very complex system. And it is undoubtedly the case that if we are to look at uh, a strategic examination of education, which involves a wide range of subjects, uh, notwithstanding the, the, looking at the issue of a single education system, but goes well beyond that to a wide range. How we, for instance, ensure that early years is, is catered for. Yes, I'll be happy to give way. Grateful to the member for giving way. Uh, point number 18 on the explanatory and financial memorandum that was produced uh, by the member from Strangford says, an equality impact assessment has not been undertaken as communications between the member and the Equality Commission and the legal advice the member has received did not identify any equality implications of the bill. Therefore, it is considered the bill will not have an adverse impact for any of the groups identified in Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act. Considered is not the same thing as proven. And as a man who was a minister, does he anticipate that there may well be legal challenge in terms of the Section 75 implications of the legislation, particularly Clause 7? I mean, look, I was going to come on, I think, at a later stage to the issue of equality, but the member makes a very valid point uh, that, you know, it, it does seem to me that if we were to have the best possible quality of legislation, to then have a situation in which there's not been a quality impact assessment seems to be a very strange situation. Both maybe wearing both hats uh, as both a former minister but also actually as a, a former barrister in, the, in that regard seems a very strange position. I'm sure the member will be dealing with this in her remarks. But it, it, it does seem to me that on other occasions the Alliance parties and others will be very, uh, very strong on arguing that, that we need things that are equality proofed, that are EQIA proofed, yet there seems to be a certain level of well, actually, we don't consider it necessary in this particular case, which doesn't seem to be a particularly um, strategic way of looking at things. Mention has been made on a number of occasions because I think the NDNA commitment, which um, certainly all the government parties signed up to, uh, was for that independent review. Now, despite COVID, which I think probably did delay things, that has begun to uh, be put in place. It required a terms of reference, which was, uh, had to be agreed by the executive as a whole, which it did by all five parties. It then required public advertisements for um, those who had expressions of interests, receipt of those CVs, a sifting process, and an interview process of um, 
potential members of the independent panel. All those actions have now taken place, uh, and I believe that we would, within a relatively short space of time, the Minister uh, would be due then to announce that. So if we're looking at this in a strategic way, why take one aspect of the education system um, to take, I think, Mr O'Dowd's point of whether there's necessary um, legislation on that basis, and given the fact that the legislation itself duplicates functions that are in some cases already there, but then also preempts uh, that independent um, that independent review, which I would say in terms of it, it you know, none of us know what will what will emerge from that, whether it's myself or the minister or indeed any of the parties. Yeah, I'll give I'll give way. Member give way. Obviously the issue of the independent review of education has been raised a number of times, but given there is a report from the Department of Education specifically on recommendations for integrated education from 2016. Why would progress not be made on that particular report? A number of, without going into details, I'm sure the Minister will deal directly with this. There are a number of aspects of this where they have been implemented. There are others which may well then be part of the, the wider examination, I think, have been referred as part of the terms of reference to the independent um, review, which, again, I would indicate that all parties in the executive signed up to those terms, including areas which would be covered by the um, uh, report on integrated education to be put into the independent review. And there are a few uh, clauses which, and a few of the recommendations which the sector itself did not support. So the point is that even the report that was there in terms of integrated education is on one specific aspect of, of education. Now, all of us, I think, would accept there are wide-ranging issues to be dealt with in education, and that we all accepted that rightly the way to do that was through from the NDNA for an independent review to take place. That will be something that will have to be very thorough and weighty. It will take some time, but there are timescales being put into that as well. And it does strike me then to take one aspect of the wider education system, and indeed this is not something which is just a level of tinkering, it has fairly fundamental uh, implications, I think is the wrong approach to do that. And I would say that anybody who believes in strategic reform of uh, the education system should say that, that actually this is, this is a bill which simply preempts that and is not necessary. Secondly, and I suppose the member for South Belfast had raised this in terms of equality issues, Look, I believe fundamentally that all our children should be treated equally, uh, that the rights of parents and indeed their choices should be treated equally. But in terms of equality, this is not Quality. This is putting one particular sector at a different level on a higher plane than any other sector. And this is writ large throughout the, the bill. Mention has been made um, by Mr O'Dowd in terms of Clause 1. And I would say as well, the idea in terms of both Clause 1 and Clause 2, to give a definition and then a, a purpose for integrated education if the intention is to say this is something that only pertains to integrated education, it is fundamentally an insult to the schools that are out there that are delivering this. Now, um, I'll not reiterate the issues that were raised in Clause 1 by uh, Mr O'Dowd, but again, if we take a look at Clause 2, the purpose of integrated education, I think Mr O'Dowd said it was about the one clause he hadn't mentioned um, in his speech. The purpose is to deliver educational benefits to children and young persons, to promote efficient and effective use of resources, to promote equality of opportunity, to promote good relations, and to promote respect for identity, diversity and community cohesion. If the mover of this, of this bill, or indeed anyone in this House, can point to any school in Northern Ireland which is not based on those principles, which is not delivering on those principles, then I think it should be cause for concern for the Department of Education. But to say that this is something which is ring-fenced purely into integrated education, as with Clause 1, I think is an insult uh, to the other schools. We move then on to the issue within uh, Clause 4, which shifts from a, the 1989 requirement to encourage and facilitate, and which is done largely through NICE, but also to promote. Again, we have a, a situation which promotion because promotion at present is in legislation in terms of shared education involving all sectors. But if we take a single sector and say that alone will promote, where does that leave the other sectors? Where does it leave 
Uh, for example, the Irish medium sector. Where does it leave maintained schools, controlled schools, or other schools? It is a clear attempt to put one section and one set of choices on a higher plane to others, and to send out a strong signal to parents that if you dare to choose a different path for your child, if you believe there is a school that lies outside the integrated sector, then in some way you are not making the right choice for your, your child. That has then reinforced, I think, the, uh, the much attacked today Clause 7, which talks about new schools. It, now, I'm glad I understand earlier on the proposer gave a definition of new schools that, that they were talking about newly created schools rather than uh, a newly built school, although I do have to say that is not on the face of the bill, so I think that would one of the things that would have to change if this does progress. But a presumption that every school that is built from now on, whether it is, for example, an amalgamation, whether it is simply uh, dealing with a particular level of um, growth in population, um, unless it, it falls into these special circumstances, will be an integrated school, is saying to the control sectors, saying to the maintained sectors, saying to Irish medium, well, actually, you can't really have a new school built unless you can have what seems to be ill-defined issue of special circumstances in some way to, to justify it. Yep. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the relevant clause makes reference to by reason of special circumstances, part one, then goes on to say to define what is not to be considered as a special circumstance. So th that is clear, the religious demographics of an area or the existence of spare places in existing schools. So having sort of strangled off parental demand for new school buildings and disregarded the existence of spare places in other nearby schools, what circumstances would a school get built? It seems to be strange at best. It is silent on, on the issue. At worst, it is, it is effectively imposing a single sector on every potential school. And indeed, in a situation which we will come to later, which is effectively a certain level of badging of a school rather than actually being driven from that. The third reason I think that this is fatally flawed is it produces... You know, I, I, see, the, I see the member chuntering from the, uh, from the sidelines in, in relation to it. OK, well... Uh, glad to see, obviously, that, that you're reaching out the hand of friendship to people before profit in that, in that regard. But I think this is riven with muddled thinking and uh, a costly approach. In terms of muddled thinking, the meaning of promotion at 5.1a talks about, and I would have some sympathy to say, uh, looking at how supply could be, uh, could be increased to meet demand. But this again takes this uh, almost Stalinist approach of actually an aim to increase demand. You can pick any type of school you want, so long as actually you're doing the thing of, of picking an integrated school, because we've got to push up the demand. Now, if, as indeed uh, we've been told in terms of the level of survey evidence of the demand that is out there, one wonders particularly why this is necessary, but it seems to be a model of thinking of pushing up demand. And similarly, on B, uh, again, when we talk in terms of financial, and, and again, uh, you know, some of the members have talked about the costs of division, but yet this would actually be establishing new schools very explicitly, deliberately disregarding where spare places exist, including on that basis if there were spare places exist in a local integrated school, but you could still build another one on that basis. I mean, that seems to be a level of muddled thinking at best. In terms of cost, it is not only that, but we see, again, fairly ill-defined in terms of the um, integrated education strategy, requirements on a number of the, the points at 2A, 2D, for instance, to have increased funding commitments and resources. We are told, and indeed it has been reiterated on a number of occasions, the level of financial pressures that schools are under, yet mystically the department then will find these additional resources simply to promote particular activity. And again, which I know uh, was raised, I think, by Mr O'Dowd at C, um, include arrangements for full access for integrated schools to training and resources provide the Education Authority. Well, the point is actually in terms of what is available. First of all, there should no gateway check on any sector to say that you get some form of additional level of resources. 
And indeed, in terms of the training that is available, it is available for all sectors throughout there. And, and you know, either this is something that is unnecessary, or alternatively, it's something that is giving favourable treatment uh, to one sector. I mean, are, are we to say that in terms of training, if you happen to work for a control school or work for a maintained school, you should be given lesser level of access in that regard? Because clearly at the moment, you know, well, I see the member shaking her head, but I, I, I am genuinely, I, I'm bewildered as to why this is, this is in here, so I'll be happy to give away. Because GMI, the Grant Maintained Integrated Schools, do not have access, and you'll know this, to legal or HR advice. And indeed, a range of schools, and don't forget, not all integrated schools are GMI on that, on that basis either, on that basis. And there are also, as indicated, if we are to have equality across it, are we going to have equality on the basis then of saying that, uh, that all schools are put on exactly the same framework? And if that is the case, then that also means that, that for the development of a new school, it should be identical numbers to what is there and control to maintain. So, you know, I welcome that, that clarification. But also one other example of the muddled thinking of this, indeed one which I think takes us in a very dangerous position in terms of area planning. So there is a requirement that targets and benchmarks by the department must also include the number of development proposals created and delivered for the expansion of existing integrated schools. And the member is, is, is nodding her head. The member is, I'm sure, clearly aware that in terms of developing development proposals, they don't come from the Department of, of Education. They come from various sectoral bodies. But the people who actually give the legal verdict and whether a DP is approved or not approved or modified is the department and, more specifically, the minister. So we seem to be left in a situation where those who would actually give the verdict uh, are also the people who are then made provision to actually try and encourage these DPs in the first place. That is a bit like saying to a judge, you have a target for the number of convictions that you're going to uh, have this particular year. Uh, but by the way, you can actually judge all these cases on a, on a level playing field. It is, it is something which r runs a coach and horses through um, the idea of area planning. And we should be trying to find within area planning a greater level of cohesion be between sectors, rather than simply trying to promulgate one sector above all others. And finally, I would say that in terms of um, the the overall proposal, I have to say, I don't see how this is advantageous to integration itself, because on two separate occasions within the bill, it indicates that it explicitly says that in terms of new schools or indeed of the meaning of promotion, there is, it is specifically barred looking at any form of demographics within an area. Now, given that, that there is an earlier requirement which suggests there should be reasonable numbers of, of both communities, um, if, for example, we're looking at new school, and we know that what is sort of indicated is not special circumstances. If a new primary school, for example, because of demographic pressure, is built in an area which is overwhelmingly of one community or another, um, are we simply going to create a situation that instead of a mixing of our young people, we're going to create a situation where artificially schools are simply badged, that they will be an integrated school irrespective of whether or not um, the numbers provide a level of mix. I mean, I have seen the proposer of this um, indicate, and rightly reflecting particular polls, that most people want to see schools where their children go to, which have a mixture of, um, uh, of people of, of different backgrounds and different faiths in that regard. I think that's perfectly fine. But then to create a situation which utterly disregards what the overall composition of an area is, which actually run a, a coach and horses um, through the idea of getting a particular mix or any level of mix, actually means that, that we will be observing the name of integrated education while in practice simply doing something which would, which would ratchet up the, the figures. And that is why I think, I think it is fundamentally wrong, particularly in terms of the issue of new schools, um, that there is no cognizance to be given of the demographics. There is no cognizance to be given if we're looking at efficiency on the basis of existing school spaces. And I have to say, the general consensus, while it is, I think, one of the most painful activities that any education minister has to do from time to time, is 
there is an acceptance, I think, that across our school estate, that there are ultimately probably too many school buildings, and it means that we don't have an efficient. But I see the member nodding her head, but she would then create new buildings without any regard to existing spare, spare places. Okay, I'll give way. Thank you very much for the member to give way. Um, and I'll remind the member about Justice Tracy's ruling that said that integrated education is a standalone concept. So if there are spare places in a controlled school or a maintained school, why should an integrated school then not be able to be developed further um, or to grow in that case? Because as a Catholic who lives in a, an area that would be perceived to be unionist, would it be assumed then that where I live, it would only be a controlled school and I would then go to a maintained school? Why not an integrated school? But the, the standalone concept means that as a parent, I have the right to choose integrated education. Is the right to choose. And frankly, you say, why not an integrated school? Yes, why not an integrated school? Why not a maintained school? Why not a controlled school? But actually what this is saying is you disregard from an efficiency point of view any level of spare capacity, we're simply going to be building more schools for the sake of actually facilitation on that basis. Well, look, you know, the member may, may shake her head. It's there in black and white. It is there in terms of, in terms of and indeed in terms of the, the area planning. And it should be about meeting the needs of areas, meeting the demands of parents. And this approach, which simply says that a new school has to be of one particular type, means that you're effectively putting down the barriers to any form of, of new school, no matter what the, uh, the desire of parents locally, no matter what uh, the, the overall mixture within an area, indeed in terms of what is, is sensible with, within an area. What I would say uh, to members in closing, you know, I, I have listened very carefully to a range of the comments made uh, by members. Uh, I would say that, that they seem while occasionally wrapping it up towards the end in a, we think this is a reasonable enough bill, let it go forward. They've, they've lacerated this bill from one end to the other. Almost all the speeches that I've heard, with the honourable exception clearly of the, uh, the representatives of the Alliance Party who are very strongly in favour of this, um, have essentially highlighted the range of problems within this. They will say such and such clause is terrible. We want change to that. We have concern about that. But then we're happy to support the concept. Uh, you know, I simply give that level of um, marker I would put down to members that once you've accepted, and it is clear uh, that there are a lot of members from across the board who want to make very major changes, at least to this, this bill, um, I would say that once you've accepted the full principles of this, you will find that the level of amendments you're able to put down will be severely limited on that basis. And if people genuinely have this range of concerns, if you genuinely believe that actually education and the reform of education should be done in a strategic manner, if you genuinely believe that actually all our children and parental choices, uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm coming to you now, I'll, I'll give away briefly. The, the member keeps referring to um, reform in education in a strategic manner. As the minister who commissioned the independent review of education, was that done so in a non-strategic manner? Sorry, the independent review? Of, of integrated education. You're, you keep saying that this should be done in a, in a strategic think, yes. manner. Are you saying the review you commissioned on integrated I education? I think you'll find it's very, not strategic. Um, sorry. It's not a chat that's... No, that's right. Never just, okay. I, I uh, think actually you'll find, you. and I think I'm right in saying it was, it was produced uh, while I was minister, it was published during the minister, it was actually commissioned by the previous minister, uh, Mr O'Dowd, uh, I think he will uh, admit to that on that, on that basis. On it. But the point, the point, the point is that, that as regards that review, it was a review that focused in on one single aspect of our education system. The whole point of all of us signing up to NDNA, the whole point in all the executive parties, and I appreciate there's a few representatives who are not members of the executive parties here today, but all five parties agreed to the full terms of that independent review, including the aspects which would be superseding what was there in terms of previous reports. If we're going to, if anyone believes in a strategic review of education, you do not take one aspect of it in a piecemeal fashion and try to drive it forward. If you believe in equality and actually a genuine level playing field between sectors, a genuine level playing field that no child has any level of advantage depending upon what gates, school gates they go through. 
genuine equality that parents, um, when they are making their choices in terms of for their children, are genuinely treated with respect and that no one choice is put superior to the other. If you genuinely believe in ensuring uh, that we have a cost-effective system and a system which is coherent, and I would say, given that some of the um, some of the language used within the bill, if you genuinely want to see sharing and integration within this society, then it is not enough simply to make a range of criticisms about this bill. This bill, unfortunately, is fundamentally flawed, and I would urge members today to vote against uh, this bill and let us actually move forward with the NDNA commitments of the Independent Review. I call Christopher Stalford. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Firstly, I wish to say it is possible to believe in the general principle that all of our children should be educated together and to oppose the content of this bill. There is no contradiction in believing that. As a general principle, and that is what we discuss at this stage, as a general principle, I believe that our children should be educated together. And my party has held to this position for some considerable length of time. I recall uh, an address given by the then uh, First Minister, uh, the Right Honourable Peter Robinson, in which he outlined a vision for a genuinely shared education system. And the reaction to that speech on that occasion demonstrated to me that there are significant vested interests in the provision of education that will need to be tackled if we are to achieve a situation where all of our children are educated together. So I want to say to members from the Alliance Party, please do not represent my opposition to this bill as representing opposition to our children being educated together, because it most certainly is not. I have in my constituency an excellent integrated school. Indeed, it has been the flagship for the integrated education movement. And the other member from the, the constituency, who was a member of the first set of children that were educated there, can speak to the quality of the education that she received at Lagan College. Try to say this as, as respectfully as I can, because I realise that, that, that this is a reasonably sensitive issue. Okay, but I, I think there is a degree of accuracy in saying that that the school, the excellent school to which he refers, and affords excellent support had to withstand the level of opposition that is being put forward to this type of reform today. And, and maybe another member from South Belfast can, can testify to that in a bit more detail. The, these, the member himself refers this is going to be difficult. This is significant change. Um, and indeed, my, own, my recollection is that Peter Robinson went as far to say it was morally wrong that we separate children on the basis of community or religious background at the age of five. So I think we are going to have to do more than we have done to date than just say, we, we, yes, we wish the children be educated together. I think he was right in saying that it was morally wrong. And I also think that we were right, all of the parties who signed up to New Decade New Approach. I, I see um, the commitment to the review of education as almost similar to uh, the Ben Goa report for the health service. That is how far and radical and brave I want it to be. And when Bengoa was being talked about, I said on that occasion that it was the responsibility of all of us to give the Health Minister the cover that he needed to take decisions that would not go down well in some quarters because it was the right thing to do. I say that again in relation to education reform, that I hope that a consensus can be built around this issue and that the Education Minister would in turn uh, be given that cover and that support, because I do not believe that there is a disagreement about the ultimate goal, which has to be securing a situation where our children are educated together. Not only uh, do I have an excellent uh, secondary school of an integrated uh, status in my constituency, but other schools, more recently Harding Primary School uh, at the top of the Craigor Road, uh, recently applied for and secured um, integrated status. I think it is important to put on record, would we pick to have that which we have now if we were designing a system of education provision? And I do not think any reasonable person could say that we would. With the, the number of sectors that there are out there, 
the waste that there is clearly in the system, the, um, the need for brave decisions around school estate and different issues. So, no, of course, if we were setting out from a uh, blank to design an education system, you wouldn't design that which we have here in Northern Ireland. And there's lots of different historical reasons in terms of religious groups not wanting to give up control of schools and the 1947 Act was passed and different other reasons as well. I understand Mr Shane outlined, because I heard him, understand the reasons why they felt that that was the right thing to do at the time. Um, but would you design it now? You know, it's like the expression that a, you know, a, a camel is a horse designed by a committee. The education system that we have um, certainly is not um, ideal. I want to make just a point in terms of many of the schools in my constituency. Uh, my constituency members know there are five different parties who represent South Belfast in this place, and that's reflective of the fact that it's an extremely diverse constituency. And many of the schools in my constituency I would describe as integrated. I understand there's a separate concept of integrated, and um, Ms Armstrong can speak to that. But many of the schools, because they're representative of the community, they're reflective of the communities that they serve. So I think of schools, you know, schools like Botanic, where more than 50 languages are spoken. Fane Street, where that's the same. Um, Rosetta Primary. They are integrated in the sense that they are truly reflective of all of the community that they serve and that lives in, uh, that, in the constituency that I have the great honour to represent. So I am concerned that many of those schools don't get the credit that they deserve because they don't have a particular word on the sign at the front of the school. But I don't want us to jump the gun on an ongoing process about the future of education. The Minister is obviously going to take receipt of that review and it will be her job to take through the recommendations that are made from it. I said in an earlier intervention that I think that Clause 7 has obvious equality implications, and I know um, the member from Strangford will dispute with me on that, but when you create a situation where, as the clause says, when planning for the establishment of a, a new school, education bodies must apply a presumption that it will be an integrated school unless that would be inappropriate by reason of special circumstances. So we put the by reason of special circumstances. And then the next paragraph, the following are not to be treated as special circumstances for the purpose of rebutting the presumption in subsection 1, the religious demographics of the area and the existence of spare places in existing schools. So I, I just have very deep concern about that clause and what that means for other education providers. Certainly. It occurs to me that, that simply by defining a couple of areas which aren't special circumstances but giving no indication whatsoever kind of special circumstances, this is simply a recipe for some level of court challenge and it, it being decided in the courts. And doing so, I think, on the very flimsy basis of having no real guidance within the legislation as to what counts as special circumstances. Uh, no doubt, should this piece of legislation pass and become the law of the land, uh, JRs will be flying left, right and centre in terms of the decisions that, that will be made. Uh, absolutely no doubt about that. As I said earlier in my remarks, I want to see absolute radical reform of how education is delivered. I said at the start of this mandate that public service reform and how we deliver public services was going to be our biggest challenge. We wasted so much time that could have been used driving through a, a reform of public services. And I hope that there's a commitment, uh, either in the time that we have left and in the new mandate, the public service reform, education and health in particular, will be uh, the, the lodestar of what we're trying to do in this place. I'm concerned that, effectively, the bill ascribes what I would, I would describe as a Henry Ford style of approach to education. You can, Henry Ford famously said, you can have any type of car you like or any colour of car you like, so long as it's black. And I'm afraid this is, you can have any type of school you like, so long as it's integrated. And I am concerned, just in terms of the practical outworkings of that. I want to raise the issue 
of religion and religious values. I'm someone that was educated in a controlled school and then a controlled grammar school. Any person that thinks that those of us who travelled through that route were inculcated with Protestant values, you're wrong. In terms of the religious views, the religious values that I hold, I did not acquire them through my education, through my schooling. And as a parent of four young children, I regard it as my duty, not the duty of the school, to share with my children my religious values. I'm not suggesting for one second the pursuit of religion out of education. Absolutely not. Of course I'm not. But any person who thinks that, uh, certainly, I know the, the shorthand is basically there's Protestant schools, there's Catholic schools, and there's integrated schools. I just want to say, as someone who went through what's classified as the Protestant route of education, I can assure you that my religion wasn't picked up in school. I think um, there are area planning implications here, and I think it's clear that what this will do, if it's enacted, will warp uh, provision, uh, will warp the, the, the provision of schools. All the points highlighted, all the points highlighted by others speaking in this debate regarding the problems of the, bill, of the bill mean that you couldn't possibly vote for it. You can't, and I think that the, what is going on is um, there's a fear to be seen to be against integration. That's not true. It's not true to say that uh, the two are mutually exclusive in terms of you have to vote for this bill, otherwise you're not in favour of our children being educated together. And can I say, in my constituency, reference is made to polling numbers showing that people want their children to be educated alongside children from other backgrounds and, and identities. In my constituency, every day, that is exactly what's being delivered by so many of the schools. So, of course, people are going to want it, but in South Belfast, in vast swathes of South Belfast, they're already getting that. And uh, therefore, I think it's just important to put on record the appreciation of the work of all of the education sectors, all of them, but let's not denigrate the efforts at community building, bringing people together and serving the, the entire community that all of the sectors do. Thank you. I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in rising uh, to speak on the Integrated Education Bill, I'm first of all conscious um, of the time of year. Not only have pupils just started their summer holidays um, after, most ex uh, after most extraordinary and stressful school year, but we are at a time when some of us think uh, long and hard about the divisions that, this, that exist in our um, society. We are all uh, in this place, and I don't just mean the Northern Ireland Assembly, I mean uh, in this society, in this jurisdiction, burdened by the weight of history and identity. Even if we try to avoid politics based on division, we still live in a divided society. Uh, we are reminded of this uh, regularly, and particularly at this time of year. Whatever our perspective on the history of this place, and whatever our vision of the future, it is incumbent on every single one of us to use the power we have to tackle division. And division is such a profound and defining part of this place that it is sometimes strange to hear people stand up and argue somehow that we should not be straining every sinew in order to tackle it. Uh, we may not agree on the Constitution, we may take different views on how to tackle uh, sectarianism uh, in the long term, but we should be able to find common ground in the short and medium term on how we address one of the, by far, far from the exclusive area of division, but one of the areas of division, which is the, the fact uh, that, we, that so few of our children are, Mr Deputy Speaker, educated together. It has been pointed out already that 7% um, of children, uh, just 7% of children, um, are uh, educated in the integrated sector. Now, it is true to say, as the previous speaker, my colleague from South Belfast, just said, not all, many children from one denomination or from a particular uh, communal background go to schools of, as it were, 
a, a different or the other uh, communal background, and that is particularly true in South Belfast, and that's something I'm very proud of. Um, uh, in South, technically, Lagan College is not in South Belfast, but South Belfast is actually in the, the Bill Proposers constituency of Strangford, um, but it is effectively a South Belfast school, and its pupils from South Belfast go there. Uh, there are many schools in, in South Belfast that have become, uh, I suppose, de facto integrated, to use, uh, to, to use a phrase. Um, I'm afraid it's, it is worth saying, however, that, that if that were the norm across Northern Ireland, and if that were um, custom and practice, then perhaps we could be a little bit more uh, relaxed about integrated education uh, and about how we deliver on the commitment that was made in the Good Friday Agreement to encourage and facilitate integrated education. The fact is that it isn't. Our education system is too divided. And as I've been listening to the debate today, and I will come on to some of the specifics in the bill, because there are questions to be asked about the bill and there are points to be clarified and there are, I think, legitimate areas where people will want to ask questions and even propose amendments. That doesn't mean that they um, have issues with the core purpose of the bill. But um, uh, one of the points uh, that has been uh, made is that, um, is, is in a sense somehow that we, uh, that, um, or I suppose I should say, having listened to, to the debate, I've, I've been struck at times how, how often people go back to their own personal experience and how often people go back to, to a sense that the school that they were educated in, whether that was a controlled school or a Catholic Ventian school, that didn't teach them division, it didn't teach them to hate, and of course it didn't. Of course it didn't. The vast majority of schools, whatever background they are, whether they're Catholic maintained, controlled, whether they're selective or non-selective, whether they're Irish medium or not, of course they are full of brilliant teachers. There are many schools that are effectively single identity but are full of brilliant people doing amazing work for kids. But there's a difference when we make policy, when we make public policy and seek to provide goods for society. Uh, when between looking at the structure of an overall system and looking at the manifestations of that structure and the, and the specific, um, specific issues. Of course, individual teachers and in individual schools uh, are wonderful and brilliant and they're delivering amazing things for their pupils. But is our education system too divided? Yes, it is. I'm afraid that's an undeniable conclusion um, uh, based, on, based on the numbers. It's also true that uh, Many, people, many, many parents do want to be able to choose integrated education, um, but aren't at the minute able to send their kids to integrated school. Um, so, uh, in supporting the broad principles of this bill, I want to say very clearly that it is my view that integrated education uh, is, uh, a, 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 and the broader project of overcoming division in education and division in our young people has to be uh, at the core of what we do in this place, and we can't simply, um, and we can't simply pretend that there isn't a problem here. I last year uh, returned to Northern Ireland after uh, quite a while away, and it does sometimes intrigue me to hear people minimise uh, the issue of division in the societies if it didn't exist or as if it's, uh, there's other ways of tackling it. And you know what? We're 23 years on from the Good Friday Agreement. We need to get serious about this stuff. Um, we can't pretend that there aren't very real issues and that uh, the way we um, and the way our education system is structured don't contribute to those. And that will mean difficult conversations, because I can, se I can sense how difficult the conversations will be in this room today. Because as I said earlier on, people tend to get offended a little bit when, they, when we talk about this, and they, they feel, perhaps understandably, that they want to defend perhaps the choices their parents made, or defend the choices that they might make for their kids. And this should not be no conversation about promoting a, a less divided educational system should imply a judgment on any parent or on anyone's parents or on any institution, whether that's a Catholic maintained school or a controlled school. I'll come on briefly to the question of selection, which is another bugbear. There should be no judgment implied. But that doesn't mean that we can't, as legislators, and we are legislators here, draw serious conclusions and try and take action to uh, address some of those challenges. So I commend the bill sponsor, notwithstanding the fact that I and, and my party spokesperson have said we have specific questions and issues that we want to discuss and resolve that commend the bill sponsor for bringing this bill forward. Um, it is true that there is an overarching uh, uh, review of education and it is a legitimate comment that in uh, seeking to produce a, um, an education, uh, an overall program of reform for the educational system, you would want to do that in a joined up way, particularly because we have got such an incoherent educational system overall. But I suppose it is also true to say that we shouldn't make uh, 
uh, the perfect, the enemy of the good. Um, given how long it takes to get to reform in this place, and we've experienced it with Bengoa, we've, we'll experience it on the subject of licensing, another subject that I've spoken to with the bill sponsor about. We shouldn't, be, uh, we shouldn't look at the proverbial gift horse in the mouth. If we can come to uh, a bill which, um, after scrutiny, uh, and, and consultation, and, and if necessary, amendment uh, moves this agenda forward. Then who are we? Who are we here to gain say an important piece of progress at doing what we were pledged to do in 1998, but haven't done enough of yet, which is tackling divisions in our society? And I do think it doesn't become this chamber, having seen some of the divisions that we saw on our television screens earlier this year, to take lightly issues of division. So I want to. Uh, so I just want to set that down as a principle, uh, and I get the people uh, that, that these uh, debates sometimes make people uncomfortable. Education is not the sole cause of division, and increasing integration will not solve the challenges uh, in this society. Uh, my God, they existed long before universal education. They existed long before the partition of Ireland. They existed long before the Act of Union. So they won't be resolved uh, with this bill. But that doesn't mean that we should um, we should seek to to avoid uh, or to, to not make progress um, where we can. I do want to come on and talk about the complexity of our education system because one of the drivers uh, of uh, difficulty in our education system is the fact that it's so complex. I speak as someone who's uh, uh, now got a son who will be going into nursery or preschool. Uh, later this year in an integrated one, I'm, I'm lucky to say, but that's only because there, was, there were a limited number of places and, and he was lucky uh, to be able to get in. Um, our education system is extraordinarily complex. Um, and it is true that um, uh, that's very difficult for parents to navigate. It has been said, and I agree with the point, that if you're designing an education system, you uh, wouldn't you clearly wouldn't start from here. The education system is not, no one came up with a blueprint to decide what would be a coherent uh, educational system in order to uh, produce the best educational outcomes or a less divided society uh, and come up with the one that we have at the minute because it doesn't generally produce very good educational outcomes and it, I'm afraid, reinforces the fact that we have a divided society. So everything we can do to address those challenges we need, uh, we need to address, there are the twin track challenges of um, division and of um, uh, and of severe educational underachievement, uh, and they connect with one another and at times reinforce one another. And um, on a few of the specific uh, questions, um, there are questions that my uh, party colleagues and others have raised, and, and I think it's entirely legitimate to ask specific questions about a piece of legislation. Our job in supporting the broad principles today is not to simply say, "Well, we have no questions and, and we'll and we will um, and we'll wave it through." We wouldn't be doing our jobs uh, as legislators. If we didn't, the uh, question of the meaning of promotion has been raised, and I know the bill sponsor is doing some thinking on that and has done some thinking. So I think that's a that's a question that people um, people will want to understand that, uh, and, and it will be scrutinised in committee, and that is totally uh, legitimate. Um, uh, as I say, um, we have a deeply divided society, and if we pretend that we don't, and if we pretend that education isn't part of that division, then we aren't uh, going to tackle it, and we aren't about. Um, uh, and we aren't about getting, you know, getting real in terms of, of addressing these issues. And we are uh, increasing the chances that we pass on this division to the next generation. Um, and I'm afraid that's simply not good enough. And I should say, because there are part of the reason why I think this gets uh, to people's sense of who they are, and, and at times their identity, is the sense that um, uh, is the implication. I suppose that some people are saying that the integrated education system is. Um, is more morally, uh, more morally apt, or, 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 or uh, you know, is it, that there's something kind of uh, superior about um, about people who are advancing integrated education. I mean, I, all I would say is that, you know, if you recognise that we have a profoundly uh, divided society, if you recognise that one of the key tools to addressing that will be integrated education, uh, then I. I I think it's incumbent on all of us to do what we can to support it. But that also means, to come back to this point about, um, uh, about diversity in education, that also means that while we have a diverse education system, and unless and until we, we move to some uh, new uh, unified single education system, um, why not have a conversation about how uh, our various sectors become themselves more integrated? The previous speaker spoke about schools in South Belfast. 
we won't agree on we don't agree on all that much, and we won't agree on huge amounts of this bill. But I actually agree with a lot of what he said. Um, Rosetta Primary, Botanic, um, uh, Methody. In the in the I mean, Methody is a, is in the sense the textbook example of a school which has integrated itself. Uh, the the market in a sense integrated Methody. Um, uh, I don't say that in a flippant way, but it's a product of of a, of a diverse place. There are other post primary schools. Indeed, in the maintained sector, there are. Um, there are schools in South Belfast that have a higher than average intake of non-Catholic pupils. Um, so while we work on this inter integrated education bill, there's nothing also to stop us looking at ways, and I would be keen to hear uh, the proposer's view on this, ways in which we celebrate and um, uh, continue to inculcate greater sharing and greater integration in schools which may not have the integrated badge. Because there are many parents who send their kids to schools that aren't officially integrated but very strongly believe in the principles of integration. They may still, they may be religious, they may be practicing Catholic, they may be practicing Presbyterians or Methodists, but they, um, uh, they may have a view on the Constitution, they may not, but they send their kids to the best performing school nearby that their child can get, get into. But they don't want uh, sharing to end at the door by sending their child to a, for example, Catholic Mintian grammar school. They haven't said, well, I don't want sharing, I don't want my child to, to have that. So, how do, we, how, do we, how do we make our education system more like that? How do we get more schools that are playing in the Schools Cup, playing in the McCrory Cup? How do we get more uh, traditional um, uh, uh, Catholic schools in the Schools Cup? How do we share the things that are important to us above and beyond uh, while we're waiting on, uh, on a genuinely transformed education system? Those are questions we should be asking to. And I think their question, the, the truth is that people in our society are asking them already. In a sense, this is one area where people, where we at times feel like we're significantly behind the public. They're asking these questions of themselves. They're asking these questions in their communities and have been uh, for some time. So in conclusion, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, let me uh, commend the bill sponsor for bringing this bill forward. Let me also say that my colleagues in the Education Committee will be scrutinising uh, this bill. That is their right. It is a bill which creates uh, new legal requirements and burdens, and it's entirely right that members should seek to scrutinise that and go through uh, the detail. But let me also say, you know, and I say this completely unapologetically, um, to some, particularly some members opposite uh, in one particular party who seem to be implying that we don't have a problem with division in this society and that educating our children separately is somehow um, you know, completely irrelevant to issues in the society, I'm afraid that is not consistent uh, with what I think a growing number of people in this society from all backgrounds think. Uh, and I think if we are seriously to represent people in this society, we need to get real about delivering on this, delivering on a more shared society, and this is part of it. Edu integrated education is not going to answer all our problems, and it is not, uh, because it's not wasn't the source of all the problems in the first place. But um, if this bill, once scrutinised and if necessary amended, helps us move that forward, um, uh, I uh, will be in full support um, of it, and uh, like lots of the, I'm sure, young people who've broken up for school this summer, I, um, I'll conclude my remarks there and hope that we get out of here fairly soon. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, and I've been listening intently to the contributions and have found this an absolutely fascinating debate. And um, I welcome the bill and have no doubt that there will be equally fascinating amendments put to this bill if it passes today at second stage. Um, but I commend Kelly Armstrong for sticking with this bill. And I've heard um, the questions raised about why did you not wait until the review happened. Um, but as far as I'm aware, this bill and this work had started back in 2016. Um, long before any attempt to undergo a review or thoughts of single education systems or new decade, new approach was being discussed. Um, so I commend you for that, for your tenacity and for bringing it forward within this mandate because um, I certainly wouldn't be waiting for a review to bring forward any change um, through the executive in Northern Ireland anytime soon. Um, but there is the potential to do some good here with your private members bill. Um, but there's not many here who would argue that our current, our current education system is sustainable. Uh, many of the issues and problems have been raised. 
Um, and I think that it's also fair to say that integrated education remains the poor relation within that system. And I certainly do support it being given equal footing and, and proper importance at the departmental level. And maybe if that importance was given um, to the sector, then perhaps that the 37 out of the 38 current grant maintained integrated schools would not be waiting today, as they have been for over one year, for the department to appoint their government um, appointments to their, their boards. So they're sitting without governors and um, being able to be appointed for over a year, 37 out of 36. Um, and that's the level of the department's commitment today, um, or just one element of it. Um, um, much has also been said about the current unsustainability, and I think I have said it in this chamber before as well, that um, across the school estate, when I'm hearing that we wouldn't have built the system this way if we were starting from scratch, I think that's a bizarre commentary to make. Um, but we're starting from where we are today, and we have the ability today to rebuild and maybe build better and make those commitments. So what would that look like, rather than looking at starting from scratch? Because today, across the school estate, there's an estimated 50,000 empty seats that we spend in the region of £95 million pounds a year on duplication of services. And a recent report from the Integrated Education Fund has told us that we've spent £1 billion pounds on cross-community projects with school, school pupils in the last 10 years. So, of course, there would be nobody building that from scratch. But that's what we're sustaining today. But we can do something better. And <laughs> I was listening to Mr. Stafford when he was saying that, uh, yes, I did go to Lagan College, um, and you made mention of the great education that I got there. And I'd love to hear what your thoughts on that great education was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to give way anytime you're ready. <laughs> because, um, when I look at parental choice, and much has been said about that as well, I look at our schools, and for me, parental choice is what led to the Irish medium sector, and it was parental choice that led to the integrated sector, because I don't know any parents who've chosen the established controlled schools or Catholic maintained schools, but certainly in my lifetime, I've seen those two sectors come about by parental choice. It was parents that drove, financed, and established Irish medium and integrated education. And that's what I think the parental choice is all about. And again, let's not lose sight of the fact that uh, I don't know any parents, not that I'm aware of anyway, who choose to send their child to a school so they can be a good Catholic or they can be a good Protestant. But parents try and choose a good school that will suit their child. But not all parents have the choice either, because most parents, or a lot of parents anyway, really only have one school option for their area, for their child, for the capacity, for the intake, for the educational attainment. And I would hope that it comes as no surprise to anybody in this house that the Green Party do not support the education system being used for religious instruction, no matter what the religion or the denomination. Schools are places for education and learning, and churches are places for religious teaching and instruction. And yet most schools in Northern Ireland are still linked to a church, and that church are given places on the Board of Governors, and it's the Board of Governors that influence and decide on the direction of tra travel for the school, for the ethos of the school, for the curriculum being taught within that school. Yep. 
with the members, the leader of the Green Party, just like to put on record, is the Green Party's position that there are objection to religious education being taught in schools as well, or is it just with regard to the ethos? Because it, after all, religious education is one of the most popular GCSE and A-level um, topics, and that's student choice. I'd like to say on that one, but thank you. No religious instruction is what I said, not religious education. Okay, to learn about the world you live in and the human population, its cultures, its traditions, its religions is absolutely precious and should be taught. That's a very different thing than religious instruction. And they both shouldn't be confused. Um, in one second, just to address the, the other point raised by the, the member um, about RE being a very popular subject choice. Um, we're also told continually that it's a mandatory choice when it's not. So most pupils will be told that they have to sit that exam, but parents have to find out for themselves that they can opt out. A lot of schools make it hard for them to opt out, and it's sold as an easy exam to get. And I speak from experience in being told exactly that myself. So I think that's probably why you would see a lot of numbers taking up that exam, but to certainly give way to the member. Thank you. I, I may be wrong. I, I think the 1947 Education Act mandates the first three years of your secondary education, you do RE. Um, in terms of my own experience um, going through Wellington College in our constituency, I can honestly say, with the one exception, uh, our headmaster was a Moravian, Mr Woods, Derek Woods was a Moravian, and there used to be a joint service at Christmas time with Aquinas. With the exception of that, that was the only religious instruction, as it were, carried out by a member of the clergy that I ever had at school. The rest of it was the teaching of RE. And of course, then the curriculum and what's taught, maybe in your sports, in your history, um, and other subjects is very, very important with that as well. So the teaching of culture is a very important um, issue to address there too. Um, but absolutely right. And, and I remember my um, RE classes, we were also taught to celebrate the Jewish Passover. And in my first year, I had to go back and talk to my mum about getting a, a recipe for unleavened bread, because that's what I had to bring in. And I don't think there was anything but a pan loaf was ever in our house before, but uh, <laughs> that was an education in itself. <laughs> so it's absolutely, to, to learn about world cultures is a valuable thing. And that's very, very different from what we use the education system for in many of our schools, about the religious instruction, and then using the curriculum for cultural um, education as well. So these are all really, really important. Um, and it, the issue was raised earlier about um, partisan appointments within this bill. Um, and I go back to, again, that a lot, most of all of our schools, I think maybe bar one, maybe the, the Rudolf Steiner School, but I could be wrong, um, are still um, linked to churches and have representation within their board of governors. Um, within the school as well. Um, and we know that these influences are really taught through the ethos of a school. Um, so what I'm assuming is what's meant by the par partisan appointments within this bill is exactly that. Um, Non-partisan is non-religious. It's about that church and education um, being closely entwined within the schools. Um, and of course, all the schools in Northern Ireland are religious schools. They're all Christian, as has been mentioned already. Um, all our schools are run on the Christian ethos, again, apart from perhaps Rudolf Steiner in Hollywood, but I could be wrong. Um, so the issue that we talk about is about interdenominational rather than religious. Um, so I'm really, really tired of listening to claims that so many schools are integrated schools just because of their pupil diversity, because that's not what makes a school integrated. It's not about the languages that are spoken. It's not about the diaspora of the pupils. It's not about the social mix. It's about the ethos. It's about the education. It's about the curriculum. It's about their sports. It's about their culture. That's what makes a school integrated. Um, and I find it really disappointing that we still understand the concept of integrated education as a numbers game, as a 60-40, as a 70-30, as a 50-50. Because again, it could be 95-5 or 100%. You know, it's some areas in Northern Ireland, because we still have a divided society, it will be impossible to hit those numbers 
from a local intake of school pupils, but that does not negate the possibility of that school being an integrated one, because the integration comes again from the ethos, the commitment, the curriculum and the culture. And when Latin College first opened back in 1981, I was, yes, as has been pointed out, my sister and I were two of the 28 pupils in 1981. And while it has been quoted that Peter Robinson has recently stated that he finds it morally wrong that children are educated separately, it was a very different case back then. And we had to establish the school in a scout hall in Ardna Valley. And we had to face protests, the world's media, and we had an armed RUC guard to get us into that scout hall. And Castlereagh Council did not want the school on its land. It fought the school getting established. I went to a Catholic primary school, and I did my confirmation, as we all did in P7. And when the diocese found out that there was two pupils going to an integrated school, they helicoptered the bishop in to come and take that mass who stood in the pulpit and told the community that there were Catholic schools and Protestant schools and neither would be taught together. And to this day, the Catholic um, Church still do not fully um, operate in integrated education. So let's not perpetuate this notion that there are de facto integrated schools. There are not. And Ma Matthew Tould, sorry, yes, well, go ahead. I mean, I, I agree with what the, what the member is saying, and we, we agree obviously broadly in this bill, but she would agree with me that, like, when it comes to, I wish there were many more integrated schools, I think we both do, they're a much bigger part of our education system. I agree that the level of division in our education system is immoral and unacceptable, but in the world that we operate in, it's better that there are some schools that are, if you want to use the phrase, de facto integrated. I'd rather that we had schools that were, as, that were more mixed than single identity in the absence of more integrated schools, if you see what I mean. That, I mean, I support this bill and I support integrated education because I want many more integrated schools, but you, would you agree with me that it's better that we have some schools, at least, that are moving towards greater mixing, even if they're not formally integrated? Thank the member for that. I would welcome the fact that our society is becoming more diverse and that people are beginning to move freely, able to live in areas. That's demographics. That's not a school going, oh, great, we'll take anybody from anywhere. That's not what's happening. Okay, I still go into schools and see the Stations of the Cross on walls. I still go into schools and see pop-ups of the Pope. I still go into schools and play football and not Gaelic games. I still go into schools and that integration is not there. It's not about numbers. Certainly, certainly. Um, there's very little me and the member I think would disagree with in terms of what education should look like. But there are integrated schools that are not integrated. And on any concept you would look at it, where Irishness is an alien concept. I have been into integrated schools where the first thing you're about in the hallway is a picture of the Queen of England. Now, is that integration? Is, I've been to uh, uh, integrated schools, which are de facto controlled schools. They went to integrated route because they've seen that as a way of preserving the future of the school. So uh, the danger in these debates is that people become very, very pious. And when you become pious, you're liable to annoy somebody on the other side of the debate or someone who's aligned to you. The, the, the principle of integrated education is something I fully adhere to. The question in my head is, is this bill the way forward in that regard, and the scrutiny of the committee will do that. But don't try and tell the House that integrated education and everyone in it is purer than snow, or purer or whiter than snow, perhaps. Thank the member for his uh, intervention there. I hope he doesn't think I'm being pious, but uh, I'll take it home with me, and that's OK. But uh, no, I'm not saying that integrated education is a panacea, and I never have, and I never would. But what it does, it goes much further in terms of providing reconciliation um, than most other things I've ever seen happen in Northern Ireland. 
And when Lagan College first started, it was started as an all children together movement for all abilities. And that's not just academic, all abilities that will come to my amazing education that I did get. And it maybe fits with the points that you raised, Mr. O'Dowd, there as well, in being able to be able to expand to the, the proper curriculum that an integrated school should be able to give. Um, when I was at Lagan, we did get taught Irish language. It was optional. Um, so that was parental choice again. Um, but we couldn't get sports in there. We were in a scout hall. And then we moved up to a primary school and we had a series of mobiles. So we weren't funded properly. That not a single penny was given. Um, and I come from a house where my mother could ill afford to cover those costs who sold her car in order to get my sister and I bus fares to go to that school. Um, so that was struggling parents put that school together. So if there was proper resource given to integrated education, to schools to fully commit to what that means, then maybe we would see a, bit of, see a bit of a change happening there. But I absolutely agree with what you've said as well. So it's not a panacea, but it does need proper commitment. And that comes from the department. Um, but all ability and all children together is not just about an interdenominational divide. That's about all abilities, physical abilities, academic abilities. Um, and because there was such little investment in that school, um, and we didn't get the whole raft, that the handful, it was only a handful, I think it was four or five full-time members of staff there. Um, I left school with one CSE. One CSE. Do you know? So it wasn't an excellent... Um, academic education I did, but what I did get was an amazing lifelong learning that has stood us all, I would argue, in good stead. Um, and I think that what we have is still an education system focused on academic ability, and we segregate along those lines as well as the denominational ones as well, um, with our um, academic achievements and our um, grammar school system, but all ability means that you can have this in one school and that means that families can also choose one school to send all their children to so whether it's academic or physical abilities that divides that one school can cater for all of that and that's something that we really need to get our head around so we can have streaming that we can have academic achievements so that we have can have grammar streams, that we can have comprehensive streams, we can have special needs streams, and that we can facilitate all physical abilities in one school. And that was the idea behind Lagan and something that it's still trying to achieve. But it was 35 years it took that school of proving itself before the department stepped in and gave them a proper building. Um, so there's much to be said about this bill. I'm going to really, really welcome it. I think the debate is long overdue. Um, I think that we still, by listening to a lot of what's been said today, understand integrated education in a very narrow way, one that I don't believe um, befits what's potentially on offer within the sector. Um, and again, commend the member for bringing that forward and thank her and really, really, really am looking forward to seeing amendments if this passes today. Thank you. I call Jim Alistair. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. There are two points of substance, or at least I think they are points of substance, I'd like to make about this bill. The first one is that it's a thinly veiled assault on academic selection. In fact, it's not thinly veiled at all. It's a, a very determined assault on academic selection. And the second one is the primacy and elitism that it brings to what is called integrated education. And the first point about the assault, which is implicit and indeed express in this bill upon academic selection, arises from the very strategic and deliberate redefinition of what integrated education is. Integrated education under Article 64 of the original order, the Education Reform Order of 1989, was defined uh, as the education together of Protestant and Roman Catholic pupils. This bill 
in Clause 12 removes that definition and rewrites the definition in Clause 1. And in the rewriting of that definition, it launches its assault upon the very concept of academic selection. Because by statutory provision, it provides that integrated education in Clause 1, 1 a, includes the various things set out, including at sea, those of different abilities. So you cannot have an integrated school if it does not embrace all abilities. Therefore, you could never have an integrated school based upon academic selection. And that is a deliberate intent of this bill. And it, it goes further in Clause 1 2 because it requires the intentional promotion of people of different abilities, underscoring that integration abhors selection, that you cannot have selection and integration in the same room. That is an open attack upon the very concept of academic selection. And of course, it comes from a party which has always been putting itself in a position to put down academic selection. Last year it used COVID as the launch pad to uh, ensure there were no uh, academic tests. Now, in a moment, now it comes to the point of out in the open making it clear that their purpose and their intent in framing an academic system in Northern Ireland is one which abhors and almost outlaws academic selection by reason of my second point, the primacy it gives to integration. I'll give away. Thank the member for giving way. I don't really intend to spend too much time on this because it seems like a, a, a far off the bill. Um, but there are people who try to perpetuate a narrative that I single-handedly cancelled academic selection last year, which has really given me significant powers beyond what, I, what exists. But um, AQE and PPTC were forced to cancel tests due to a global pandemic that had strict regulations on the movement of people. The Education Committee called for contingencies as long ago as May 2020, and they were not put in place. And I regret the experience of children and young people as a result of that. But please, please don't misrepresent me as some cause of every ill that forwarded from that, when so much effort was made to try and avoid it. Anyone who looks back on the fact that we could have, in a moment, anyone who looks back on the fact that we could have successfully, last November, had academic tests, will be conscious of the fact that the chairman of the Education Committee was one of the cheerleaders against that, advocating and demanding that we didn't have that. And of course, we then moved to an even worse stage of the uh, uh, pandemic. I'll give way to Mr. Stolper. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Alistair. I sat through many of those debates, and my recollection of events is exactly the same as yours. And uh, people who berated in the press and lambasted those who provide the transfer test procedure, everyone knows massive pressure was brought upon those organisations by political parties represented in, those ch in this chamber to cancel those tests, the consequence of which was. Lots of, excuse me, don't chunter at me order, from a sedentary order, position. Order, order, order. You're not in Downing Street now. Order. Members, this is not a debate about how the transfer went last uh, spring. This is a debate about this bill, so I would draw members back to the wording in this bill, if they might. Mr. Alistair. The total excursion began with my perceived exposition of Clause 1 1 uh, and the fact. And the fact that it uh, and the fact that it abhors and outlaws selection and uh, a difference in ability, even though we all know 
And we know it in our own families, that every kid has a different ability, some academically, some in other directions. And yet we pedal, we pedal this uh, fashionable notion that, oh, we are so high-minded, we are so liberal in our outlook that we fail and refuse to recognize the reality and we have this great homogeneous view of the world that even though we know that there's different talents and abilities, we insist on imposing an, a, 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 an educational system which fails to recognize that. And that is exactly what this bill is about. I'll give way, provided the member isn't going to lead me further astray no, outside be, the ambit of this bill. I'll be brief. I'd ask the, the member and uh, Chris Stalford to find a quote of me calling for the test to be quote unquote cancelled, as you both say, prior to November of last year. And you can bring that to the House. Plus, I presume you're, you would also challenge the expert no. panel of, on, on education underachievement as well in this regard, who or, have order, the system order, a order, systemic order, inequality. Order, order. I would draw members back to the bill, not to a debate that happened some time ago. Back to the bill, Mr. Allison. Methinks Mr. Little doth protest too much. So on this issue of the primacy, and it's, it, has a, it has a striking, breathtaking arrogance to it, the primacy that it insists in legislation to bestow upon integrated education whereby what CCMS provide, what the controlled sector provides, is lesser, secondary, to the very point that if anyone ever wants a new school under Clause 7, the presumption is it must be an integrated school. How dare anyone want to have anything else. How ignorant of anyone, of anyone to think maybe a different type of school is what I want. And to underwrite it and to guarantee its delivery, it then has the audacity in clause seven, sub clause two, to decree that the matters which you shall not consider as special circumstances include the, existings, the existence of spare places in existing schools. So you could have a situation where there's an integrated school sitting with empty spaces, but you must create a new school, and in order to create it, you must ignore the fact that there are empty spaces in the already existing integrated school. What, what an audacious attempt to impose integrated education. Yes, okay. Will the member acknowledge that when it comes to creating integrated schools, that clearly they are operating from a different basis as, for example, controlled and maintained schools? Because um, whenever the education system was created as it is now in broad terms uh, at the time of the, the creation of this jurisdiction in 1921, uh, there was no integrated sector, so there by definition starting, for, so giving it primacy as he calls it is a reflection of the fact that the integrated sector clearly has more work to do because there's an entire universe of maintained and controlled schools that have been in existence for many, many decades. Well, in fact, the, the member provokes me to change the word primacy to supremacy. That's what this bill is about, giving supremacy to the integrated sector. And, he tempts me into an historical review. One of the mistakes made in Northern Ireland at the outset was to provide other than a single state system of education. What should have been done is the state should have said, we will provide a system open to everyone. And if any church or any other body, whoever they are, want to have a different system, pay for it. And if we'd done that, we wouldn't be in this mess. But instead, there was 
generosity to ensure that churches could continue to run their own school to get to the point where the state ended up funding them 100%. That's what caused the division in our education system. And it was a mistake, I believe, in retrospect. Certainly. Uh, I'm sure the members were up until the early 1980s in the Catholic sector. It was a case of pay your own way. In many, many, in many, many circumstances it was. It wasn't until the early 1980s that there was some equality brought into the system in relation to the funding of the Catholic sector. So the members wish uh, what should have happened in the past was actually pretty close to what the reality was. The order, member order members, again, we're starting to go back into history here. I would draw members back to the bill in front of us. Mr Alistair. Well, I think, um, though he was Education Minister, the last uh, speaker obviously didn't study history very well. But Clause 7, uh, I describe it as audacious. It's so audacious that it is a calculated put-down to the Catholic maintained sector. Because this imposition that you can only have a new school that embraces this hardline definition of integration is put emphatically upon the Catholic maintained sector because it applies that stipulation to education bodies. And education bodies are defined in this legislation in Clause 13 as including not only the Department, not only the Education Authority, but the Council for Catholic Maintained Schools. So let's read Clause 7. When planning for the establishment of a new school, the Catholic Maintained Council must apply a presumption that it will be an integrated school. How arrogant. How absurd. How intolerant is that? It's beyond comprehension that anyone would think that integrated edu education is such of a holy status that it must be imposed involuntarily. That's the effect of Clause 7. It's an involuntary opposition, uh, imposition. A school might want their own new school, but they can't have it. Because Clause 7 says, no, you must have a different type of school. You cannot have your Catholic school. You must have an integrated school, as defined here. That is breathtaking in its arrogance. And the member is nodding that that's her intent. And that, of course, yeah. It actually state in Clause 7 that it would be for the department. It wouldn't be for an uh, employing body to set up the school. Um, I'd like to remind the member at this stage that the employing bodies, that is CCMS and the Education Authority, of course, are part of area planning. There is no area planning for integrated education at this point in time. So do I then surmise that it's arrogant that when any new schools being planned up until this stage that have not been integrated schools, that, that there's something wrong with that? Uh, the Minister. Order, order members, again, uh, this is the second stage of the bill. It's about the general principles of the bill. Uh, members have been making specific points, and that's an order, but we do not want to have protracted uh, debate about specific clauses. That comes l at the later stage. Mr Alistair. Uh, of course, in discussing the principles, the principles are established by the wording of the clauses. The sponsor of the bill has just read in to Clause 7 something that isn't there. She had said it talks about employing bodies. It does not. It talks about education bodies. Her bill, not me, her bill, then defines what education bodies are. And her bill says they include the Catholic maintained uh, supervisory body. So it is her words that establishes the principle. And of course, Clause 6 goes even further. And we could read it. The Catholic, the, the uh, Catholic, the Council for Catholic Maintained Schools 
must include provision for integrated education. Because that clause actually reads, education bodies must include provision for, for integrated education. And if the uh, Council for Catholic Maintained Schools is such a body, then it must include provision for integrated education. So a, a council which consciously and deliberately doesn't want to have integrated education because it wants to have its church schools, under this legislation, in the most draconian of measures, is told that it must include provision for integrated education when developing, adopting, implementing, or revising policies, strategies, and plans, and designing and delivering public services. Sure. Again, sort of going back in terms of Clause 7, um, in terms of planning for the establishment. As the member will be aware, uh, in terms of the route in which there is establishment of a new school, for a Catholic maintained school, it is a development proposal brought forward by CCMS. So they would be doing the planning of the establishment. The later stage of approval would then be given by the minister or not, but actually the planning for the establishment comes from CCMS itself. So it's, it's irrelevant in terms of whether they're a, um, simply a managing authority in terms of also uh, staffing issues. They are the planning authority on that basis. The former minister is absolutely right. So when you take clause six and seven together, they are an amazing combo of dictatorship to a sector which has the capacity to liquidate that sector. Uh, and that is incredible. So not only is this a bill intent on liquidating academic selection, it seems to be a, a, a bill intent on liquidating much of the Catholic maintained sector. Uh, so it really is beyond uh, comprehension that this House would move tonight to approve such a fundamental principle. And I've listened, I listened to Mr. O'Dowd, who very systematically demolished all the principles in this bill very effectively. And then concluded to say, but even though I've demolished all the principles, I'm going to vote for it. What is wrong with this House? Are we so beholden to perception that we think we all have to tick a box because it has a nice word in it like integration, and therefore we will vote for something we don't believe in? That seems to be where this bill has led many in this House, who in other circumstances defend the Catholic maintained sector, but tonight are going to vote for a bill because they like the title of it without considering the substance of it. That's not what we were sent here to do. And I say to this House, reject this bill. I call Jerry Carl. Every speaker, I'm tempted to say it's all kicking off in the last day of school, but I'll not use that uh, terrible, terrible joke. Um, and I welcome this bill. I uh, thank the member for bringing it and her work that she's done on it. Uh, I think the need for this bill speaks for itself. Uh, my community recently experienced sectarian riots and interfaces fueled by uh, divisive politics from the very top. I believe it is the same kind of politics which has maintained segregated education, dividing children along religious or communal lines into one camp or the other before they can even understand or comprehend what camp they are meant to or supposed to be in uh, and why. And the implications of this are clear, and there is a detrimental impact on our ability to move on as a, as a society while we continue to teach children from the earliest possible age that segregation is normal, division is normal, and that other children are inherently different to them based on how their parents were raised or where they live. It is incredible that this continues in 2021, and frankly, both sides of this chamber uh, are to blame, uh, foster blame for this, whether that's either opposing an end to segregated education or maintaining it by default. Uh, but it's important to note that despite claims to the contrary for years about a shared future, in my view, the two major blocks of nationalism 
and unionism have much to gain from communalism and division, and that uh, is about keeping people educated separately as well. Uh, we in People Before Profit would prefer to see uh, a wholly secular education system and the complete separation of any church from the running of our schools. We have seen the impact of religious influence in schools, particularly when it comes to sex and re relationship education, which leaves a lot to be desired in many schools. And it is downright dysfunctional in others, where groups like Precious Life are brought in disgracefully to teach children about abstinence because it changes with the Christian ethos of the school. That is in no way to impinge on the rights of people to practice religion, of course, or even to end religious tradition uh, being taught in an academic manner in schools, to speak to Mr Butler's point. But it is to say that education taught through the prism of religion should not be the standard. All children, regardless of religion or any other factor, should be welcome uh, to the same standard of education in any school across the North. And it is important that we recognise a growing number of people who do not uh, subscribe to any religion, to whom there is no option for secular or integrated education in their local area at all. So while we would probably go further uh, than the aim set out in this bill, I will support, uh, my party will support the bill going forward because I and we agree with promoting and funding integrated education so that uh, we can begin to end the outdated, divisive segregation of children and begin to educate them alongside their peers, regardless of background or religion. Um, and there is one area, just to, to comment uh, briefly, Deputy Speaker, which would give me cause for concern, and that is the inclusion, I, I believe, in the bill around uh, financial efficiency as a justification for integrated education. Well, we obviously support integrated education and hope to see it rolled out uh, across the North and hopefully expanded with this bill if it goes forward. Uh, we disagree that this will only come about by closing or merging existing schools, and we do not see uh, school closures and integrated education as having the, the same aim. And in, in attempting to improve education on the whole, integrated education is obviously only one step, and investment is another crucial, uh, crucially important step as well. So, brief comments, but happy to support uh, the bill. Thank you. I now call on the Minister of Education, Ms. Jemlik Levine, to respond to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And it is a cruel, result, a cruel result of our divided society that many of our children have been and remain educated separately. Uh, for many onlookers in, in places where conflict has, been, has not existed or occurred in its dim and distant past, the proliferation of sectors and divisions along perceived religious lines simply defies logic. This has already been, been referenced, but how different would our society be today if the proposals of Northern Ireland's first education minister for a single non-denominational education system had been passed? Since those times, however, our education system has become even more complex. It is faced with today's realities that former First Minister Peter Robinson set out his desire to end what he called the benign apartheid that exists in our education system. His ultimate vision, and one to which we can all subscribe, is that our children will all be educated together. However, to effect lasting and effective change, that must evolve and cannot simply be affected by clumsy legis legislation. As someone who was fortunate to have been educated at Methodist College where there was natural integration, it is of personal frustration to me at the slow pace of change even since that vision was first laid out in October 2010. There has been investment in shared education campuses and programmes, but almost 11 years on, we need a coherent plan for how we achieve and accelerate our shared goal. This is why the, the Executive has funded the forthcoming independent review of education. As a result of a history of concessions and compromises, the system we currently have is deeply complex, with a variety of sectors, management structures and ownership models. This bill, if passed, will have significant implications for the entire education system. And it is important to recognise that each sector in education, supported by a number of sectoral bodies, is working to do their best for our children. No sector sets out to divide our young people. We would not have the quality of education that does exist, even with these divisions, if our schools were not supported by the work of the sectoral bodies. And I think we should also acknowledge that the different education sectors here have been made significant efforts to work with each other and break down barriers which will support educating children together. For example, 60% of schools are involved in shared education, and I think that is to be celebrated and built upon. 
And whilst I understand and appreciate where the member for Strangford is coming from in seeking to bring communities together in our classrooms and schools, this bill brought in at this time and without full and appropriate engagement and consultation with schools from all sectors will only serve to drive people further apart. Education is an area people have strong views about and there are evident challenges with the way the system works now. However, I believe the best way to bring people together is to take the time to engage and listen, to take the time to understand why views are so strongly held at individual and community level, and take the time to get it right. I believe the forthcoming independent review of education is the most appropriate way to achieve this, as it provides the opportunity to strategically assess education design and delivery, to consider examples of best practice, gather evidence, and importantly, to carefully listen to the voice of all stakeholders. This review was agreed as a key priority within New Decade, New Approach. That agreement stated that such a review should be established with a focus on securing greater efficiency in delivery costs, raising standards, access to the curriculum for all pupils, and the prospects of moving towards a single education system. The executive has endorsed the terms of reference, which set out a wide-ranging assignment with a core focus on quality, equity and sustainability. And I hope to be in a position in the near future to appoint the panel to commence this important work. The independent review of education provides a chance to develop a radical and ambitious vision for education, design and delivery in Northern Ireland and agree evidence-based recommendations for reform and transformation. Without prejudging the outworking of the review, it's clear that there are a range of areas in the design of the current system where there may be duplication, fragmentation and inefficiency. It's critical the review panel are given the time, space and opportunity to objectively consider these issues. Indeed, all of us must approach the review with open minds and without our own predetermined views on what the key findings will be and what recommendations should be forthcoming. Rushing into unsigned legislation now will not solve the, the challenges that we face in terms of the design of our education system, nor will it secure the broad support across all stakeholders. Such broad support is essential for true transformation. The review provides the best chance to agree a vision for what a high quality, innovative and inclusive education system could look like, the outcomes that could be achieved, and the challenges that need to be overcome to deliver long-lasting reforms. New Decade, New Approach also sets out that to help build a shared and integrated society, the Executive will support educating children and young people of different backgrounds together in the classroom. And I remain committed to achieving this, but I do not believe it will be achieved by this bill. It's important to note that the review of integrated education from 2017, which is referred to in the explanatory and financial memorandum associated with this bill, contained a number of recommendations relating to how integrated education was defined in law, how it could be grown, reviewing the religious balance criteria to take account of our more diverse society and regional and local demographics, including the balance of the community in which a school is located. There are 15 such recommendations directly from the integrated review that have been included in the terms of reference for the independent review of education to be considered further. Mr Little asked why the recommendations from the integrated review were not taken forward before now. This would have been considered as a significant policy change and would have required legislation, neither of which could have proceeded without a functioning executive. Bringing legislation, such as we are discussing today, into effect that attempts to preempt the findings of the independent review of education and which would significantly impinge on the work of the panel is unwelcome and unhelpful. The political parties agreed in January 2020 that a non-political, non-sectoral and wholly objective review was an essential starting point for change. That remains my view. It's not strategically sound to push ahead with this legislation which has not been subject to the same level of engagement, consultation or scrutiny that the review will have. However, listening to members, I'm questioning if we should effectively tear up the terms of reference um, of the review and, and maybe save the £1.5 million which has been allocated to this piece of work. 
But it is important when considering the implications of this bill that we do not conflate our joint desire to have our children educated together with the supercharging of a single sector within our education system. I have looked closely at the 15 clauses set out in the Integrated Ed Education Private Members Bill, and it is very clear that, should they become law, this bill will completely undermine the independent review of education. This bill is about empowering one sector. And let us remember that there are a number of sectors currently delivering education in Northern Ireland. And if we do wish to bring those sectors together, the elevation of the integrated education sector above all others in the way this bill intends is simply not going to achieve that. Currently, integrated education is defined in the 1989 Education Order as the education together at school of Protestant and Roman Catholic pupils. This bill proposes to define integrated education as the education together of those of different cultures and religious beliefs and of none, including reasonable numbers of both Protestant and Roman Catholic children or young persons, those who are experiencing socio-economic deprivation and those who are not, and those of different abilities. While it may not be the member for Strangford's intention, this bill redefines the understanding of integrated education and will impact on the ethos that integrated schools have worked so hard to develop and refine over the last 40 years. This proposed change would also allow any school to potentially meet the definition of an integrated school and thereby by reduce legal clarity in the definition of what an integrated school actually is and in fact could serve to dilute the whole concept of integrated education. As integrated schools has, an integrated school has, until this point, been one defined and constituted in law as a grant-maintained or controlled integrated school. Far from the current practice where support for an integrated school grows from the parents and communities in which a school is or seeks to be situated, the outworkings of this bill will remove any due process or parental and community engagement. This bill will serve to impose the integrated, um, and integra integrated education sector above any other sector. The wishes of parents and children and associated parental preference will be secondary to sectoral interests. It is not clear from this bill whether the member intends that any school with a mixed religious pupil intake will automatically become an integrated school or could ask to be redesignated as an integrated school without going through the current transformation process that includes a development proposal. The development proposal process includes consultation with other potentially affected schools in an area and in addition includes wider public consultation through the statutory objection period. Area planning was established in the context of our diverse education system. It was developed to support the implementation of the sustainable schools policy and it aims to ensure that we have a system of schools that are educationally and financially viable. Schools that are the right size and type and that are in the right place at the right time to meet the needs of the children and communities that they serve. The support structures for area planning have been carefully constructed to ensure that all, all school types are represented in the planning arena. My department has no preferred model of delivery as it respects parents' right to state their preference. To elevate one school sector above all others would completely undermine the complex and sensitive environment within which area planning takes place. The trust and collaboration that has been carefully nurtured will not survive if this bill becomes law. Most, if you don't mind, I, I really do want to proceed with um, my comments. Most schools have a mix of children from different socioeconomic backgrounds. And many schools of all types have a significant number of children on free school meals. Similarly, all primary schools are all ability. Consequently, these elements of the definition would potentially apply to a wide range of education. It's also not clear from what stage of education this bill would apply. If it goes beyond compulsory schooling, it has significant implications for preschool provision which is delivered by many types of providers, both statutory and voluntary. The Bill's definitions in relation to integrated education and integrated schools are so wide 
that in comparison to the current provisions, they could potentially simply serve to dilute what integrated education has meant since it began, even before Lagan College opened in 1981. And it's not escaped my notice that this bill is being brought forward during the 40th anniversary year for integrated education, but that does not mean it is the right time for a single sector bill to become law. Clause 3 of this bill is extremely concerning in real terms. Any function the Department of Education seeks to carry out, whether required by other legislation, governance and public accountability requirements, financial or practical considerations, it is to consult with anybody which includes in its objectives the provision of support and advice to the Department in promoting integrated education. From the explanatory and financial memorandum, it is evident that the, the member considers the Northern Ireland Council for Integrated Education, NICE, could be this body. In reality, if I take an example of the statutory public consultation the Department engages in on a development proposal for significant changes in the school's estate, the legal advice is that the Department should not seek to consult with any specific group during the statutory two-month period because doing so promotes the views of that consultee above all others. This bill runs contrary to that legal advice. NICE is currently an arm's length body funded by the Department to encourage and promote integrated education. It is not a body set up for the Department to consult with on every function. Some requiring specialist or professional expertise relating to confidential matters, including those in relation to other arm's length bodies. Funding a body to carry out promotion whilst also requiring the Department to employ more staff and undertake a range of specific promotion tasks is a duplication and value for money issue. The requirements in relation to promotion and the meaning given to promotion in this bill at clauses four and five have implications throughout the Department of Education. Currently, the Department does not promote one sector over another and for good reason. The current duty to encourage and facilitate the development of integrated education enables actions to be taken for the integrated se sector that do not have to be taken for other sectors. For some, this is not enough, and we hear that 24,861 pupils being educated in integrated schools is only around 7% of the school age, po age population, and growth is too slow. Although this, of course, does not take into account the integration that naturally occurs in other sectors. For others, the provisions of the current strategy duty are too much, and this bill strikes no balance for those stakeholders. Under the 1997 Education Order, provision is made for parents to express a preference for the school or schools they wish their child to attend. For the Department to invest in the promotion of integrated education, as required by this bill, will be at the expense of other sectors. The explanatory and financial memorandum makes no reference to consultation with schools. And while I acknowledge that the member for Strangford has clarified her limited consultation from five years ago is permissible for the purposes of this bill, given the significance of the legislation being presented, I am concerned that the main education partners have not had the opportunity to comment on the substance and potential impact of this bill. If I were to bring a significant piece of legislation to the Chamber, which would essentially change the way education works in Northern Ireland with a consultation from five years ago, I would expect to be challenged, and rightly so. This bill will have significant implications for controlled, maintained and Irish medium schools. These schools currently expect that equal and fair consideration will be given to their needs from any team in the Department. Indeed, Irish medium education currently has the same statutory duty protection as integrated education for the Department to encourage and facilitate its development. All other schools would be secondary to integrated schools if this bill becomes law. The active promotion of integrated education by the Department could also potentially undermine the essential functions and purposes of shared education, which is to bring together children of different backgrounds through cooperation within a school system with a wide range of different school types, where all school types are equally valued. In the context of this new bill, there is a difficulty at its core. The bill would require the Department to apply the duty to promote by aiming to increase demand for integrated education 
and providing places to meet the demand for integrated schools without taking the religious demographics of an area or, or spare places in existing schools into account. When we set this alongside Clause 7, the implications for the entire education system and the public purse are significant and extremely concerning. Clause 7 will require that when any new school is being established, it must be presumed that it will be integrated. Again, let me give you an example of how this will significantly impact on area planning. To amalgamate two or more schools, the process is publication of a suite of development proposals. Proposals to close the existing schools and another proposal to establish a new school. If these schools are controlled or maintained or voluntary grammar schools or Irish medium schools, are we to presume the new school will be integrated? This will not encourage planning and managing authorities to bring forward proposals for sustainable provision. It will do the complete opposite. This will not foster and nourish the good relationships that are currently in place and pave the way for further collaboration across our diverse system. In fact, it could destroy them. And while I appreciate that the member has indicated that it is not her intention, um, how the bill is drafted in this respect says otherwise, and certainly the memorandum reinforces the point when it says to establish a presumption to overarch area-based planning that all new schools should be either integrated or otherwise non-single identity schools. This bill does not consider the views of the wider community who may not want an integrated school as the default solution for their area. This will be a problem if parents cannot avail of an alternative base based on the religious demographics of an area. Existing non-integrated schools will be constrained by Clause 7 in having to establish what is inappropriate by reason of special circumstance in bringing forward development proposals for new schools, and this includes amalgamations. Clause 7 will not only undermine the current area planning process, which have been carefully established and given every sector a voice around the table, but in reality will completely override these processes to the extent that area planning becomes undeliverable. Unspecified and limited special circumstances do not provide any degree of assurance that local concerns or differences can be taken into account. Effectively, if a school is to be established, it is to be integrated. This bill is also silent on ownership and management type of schools. Currently, even within the integrated sector itself, parents and boards of governors can choose grant maintained or controlled integrated status. Each offers different management approaches. Neither is imposed by the department. The requirements in relation to the department developing an integrated education strategy and reporting on this every two years clearly draws heavily on the wording of the Shared Education Act from 2016, as does the addition of the duty to promote. These requirements give no recognition to the fact that integrated education is very different to shared education. In area planning terms, for example, two years is a relatively short time, so it is not evident how these reports would be helpful. They may report activity, but how will we know if anyone is better off? Under the draft programme for government and the new decade, new approach agreement, there is a commitment to an outcomes-based approach. Targets distract from such an approach without considering if the customers, in this case children, parents, schools, staff and communities, are better off as a result of our actions. This bill serves to elevate the integrated education sector above all other sectors. It does not allow for the child to be at the centre of planning and provision. This is further evidenced by the requirements in Clause 6 for education bodies to have a provision for integrated education as an overriding factor in any of their policies, strategies, plans and public services. And I strongly contend that if any overriding factor is to be prioritised, it should be meeting the needs of the child, not the single sectoral interest above all else. And while I recognise the explanatory and financial memorandum attempts to quantify at least some of the costs associated with this bill, it does not account for the legal challenges that are likely to arise in relation to Clause 7 in particular. It does not advise me where additional funding or additional departmental staff are to be found, and it also does not recognise the additional costs for the managing authorities. As you all know, the education budget is under pressure. We need to prioritise funding to the right areas where we can make a real difference to learners in the classroom. 
An estimation of savings in 2017 does not translate into available resource now. And indeed, the specified £2.2 million, which is referenced to, is in the review of reference to in the review of integrated education as relating to initial teacher education taking place in four institutions. This is the remit for the Department for the Economy. So even were this to translate into available resource in the future, it would not come to my department. This bill is referencing potential savings, but not even covered by its provisions. I should also point out that any impact on the common funding formula as referenced in relation to the additional factors for current grant maintained integrated schools is within a finite pot. There is no available additional funding for any aspect of this bill. While others may prefer to ignore that, we have a collective duty to deliver value for money in terms of the public purse and this bill does not do that. I must also question what purpose the member considers it would serve to require the department to make supplementary regulations. Um, the suggested provisions listed in this bill are adequately covered throughout the primary legislative requirements it seeks to create. And I note the member considers this bill will not have any adverse impact on any Section 75 groups and no equality impact assessment has been undertaken. And I also note that the member considers the department can conduct the equality impact assessments in relation to policy implementation. I consider that an equality impact assessment should have been undertaken before this bill was ever introduced. Section 75 places a duty on us all to have regard to the desirability of promoting good relations between persons of different religious belief, political opinion or racial group. And I can very clearly identify the impact of this bill is undermining the good work to date in terms of good relations that the integrated sector, as currently defined, and the shared education programme have built up. This bill as a whole is likely to damage good relations in terms of people with different religious beliefs and political opinion in particular. I have a duty to every child in every school across every sector, not just one sector above all others. We have a duty, a collective duty, to manage public money effectively. There is an opportunity underway, as agreed by executive colleagues, with cross-party agreement, with funding to deliver it, to consider the objectives um, of this bill in the fullest, most appropriate way possible. Crucially, with full engagement and consultation with members of the public, with schools from every sector, with communities factored in. This opportunity is the independent review of education. This has already been agreed by political parties and by executive ministers and will commence shortly. And I know the member may be disappointed with the timescales associated with the review and wishes to rush ahead with this legislation, but reform of this scale cannot be rushed, nor can it be achieved by a solo run without support from all sectors and all stakeholders. It is incumbent on all of us to work together to find solutions to the challenges that we face, build consensus on delivery of those actions, and secure the necessary resources and commitment for educational transformation. The education system is a key driver for positive outcomes in terms of education, child development, health, the economy, and wider society and social cohesion. It is essential, therefore, that we take the appropriate time to get this right and to ensure that every child has the absolute best start in life. And it's too important to get wrong. That's a key reason I ask you to join me today in opposing this bill. Imposing this bill, and with the definition of integrated education so wide, it dilutes totally what integrated education means on the ground today, is not the way to achieve agreement and to build good relations. It is the way to achieve disagreement dissatisfaction and disharmony, and what message does that send to our children? And while I concur with the sentiments of many in relation to sharing and integration, passing this bill today will have serious, long-lasting, adverse implications for our education system. While it might be well-intentioned and, on the face of it, achieve a desirable outcome, I have set out the very serious concerns and damaging consequences that my department and myself hold and have identified with this legislation. Given the similar concerns expressed by others, it baffles me that support is being given to what is a fundamentally flawed bill. 
And by voting for the principle of the bill at this stage, I believe endorses those flaws. I would strongly encourage you to vote against this bill today and allow the issues to be considered properly through the independent review of education as agreed through MDNA. Thank you. I now call on Kelly Armstrong to conclude and wind up the debate, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Um, and I'd like to thank all who have taken part in this debate this afternoon. All I can say is thank goodness it started a bit earlier today um, because we have spent some hours on this. Um, before coming to the House today, Dennis Loretto, well known to the integrated education movement, um, sent me the following message, and I thought it would be an interesting piece to read to the House. It actually reflects some of what others have said. And he said, it's important to recognise the divided history of Northern Ireland, at worst involving horrific violence, but still stultifying process, even if not erupting into violent conduct. In addressing this division at educational level, it is not enough to ban religion-based schools and say everyone should go to state schools. The integrated movement takes aboard the varied traditions of its pupils. Religious occasions and events are recognised and, where appropriate, shared and thereby better understood. The same applies to history, both of Ireland and elsewhere. Separate schooling did not cause the divisions in society, but unquestionably integrated schooling helps to heal those divisions. And it's great to see from this opinion poll, which is the Northern Ireland Life and Times survey, that increasingly parents want this choice for their children. Indeed, MLAs from FOIL constituency will already heard what I'm just about to say from Colm Kavanagh, one of the co-authors of the Independent Review of Integrated Education, who says this bill, the aim of this bill is very simple, to encourage reconciliation. The bill wants to make integrated schooling a more real choice for parents across Northern Ireland. It is vital for our society, and particular for those parents who would prefer integrated education as an op option, that integrated education is perceived as a desired outcome that it is promoted within our education system as something that will have the effect of creating the conditions to enable children and young people to learn together for a shared society. To do this, we need to be intentional in our inclusion of all those from perceived Catholic and Protestant backgrounds, as well as those from other cultures, beliefs and communities. To enable people to be confident in their own identity and willing to tolerate and engage with other identities. And now I wish to speak to hopefully some of the comments that have been raised today. I'm sure I won't give them all um, as much time, perhaps, as, as we have taken today. Um, we started off, of course, we've had um, 17 speakers, including the Minister, at this stage. So, Deputy Speaker, if you'll give me, if I'll, I'll fly through this. I think everybody wants to go to recess shortly, so I'll try my best. Robin Newton, at the very start, thank you very much, um, Mr Newton, for coming forward. Um, just to confirm, I did have a 12-week consultation. There were 800 responses. All the relevant stakeholders were written to and met with. Um, I know that you mentioned that it was the wrong time of the bill, and others have mentioned that. You know, why would I bring this forward um, at this time, whenever it's the independent review of education? I would have loved to have had the opportunity to bring forward this bill earlier, um, but we had a gap of three years. I have brought this bill forward as soon as I could. The first, this is the first private members bill that our bills office has brought through, so I'm the very first of the of the private members bills coming forward. Um, Mr Newton had mentioned about the secularisation of schools through integrated education and I just wanted to point out that nothing in this bill takes away from the Christian base of all schools in Northern Ireland. Um, I know and I was approached um, through my consultation stage by humanists who would have liked me to um, put something in this bill about secularisation. I'm not doing that. The NICE Statement of Principles states that schools are essentially Christian in character, welcoming those of all faiths and none. The Statement of Principles is divided into four sections. I will indeed. Thank you, Member, for, for giving way. And the Member has said that she actually met with the, the, the relevant bodies who I was quoting uh, this morning. 
how is it that Mr. Jerry Campbell, Chief Executive of the Council for Catholic Maintained Scheme, Schools, and Mr. Mark Baker, Chief Executive, Control School Support Council, are indicating that they haven't had sight of the bill, and indeed that the bill gives them serious concerns? I didn't meet Mr. Baker because Mr. Baker has only been in post for a number of weeks, but I have met Jerry Campbell. In fact, I was out in his office in Lisburn. Um, the bill was published, as we all know, on the website, so they would have had sight of the bill. I personally didn't take it to them because, to be honest, I didn't have time between the time that the first reading came into this House and the bill was published and up until this point. Um, to be honest, I respected this House and the Speaker by not providing the detail of the bill in advance of it being published by the Bill's Office, by the House. Um, but I have met with them. In fact, I've met with, um, Mr. Uh, with CCMS on several occasions at events in this House that many other members have attended. But I'll move on. Um, when I was talking there about the NICE Statement of Principles, um, people have mentioned today about faith schools. Integrated schools are faith schools. Some would say actually they have too much faith in them. But an integrated school provides a Christian-based rather than a secular approach. It aspires to create an environment where those of all faiths and none are respected, acknowledged and accepted as value, member, value members of the school community. In this context, pupils will learn together all that can reasonably be expected for them to learn together. The school will facilitate specific provision where necessary for Catholic pupils whose parents wish them to undergo sacramental preparation. It will also seek to acknowledge significant religious and cultural celebrations which are representative of other faiths. The school will encourage religious and community leaders to visit and participate in school activities. Pupils will be introduced to the ideas, beliefs and practices of the major world religions and humanist philosophies in a manner appropriate to their age and ability and in line with the Northern Ireland curriculum. And alternative provision will be made for those pupils whose parents do not wish them to participate in any religious activities or classes. So I have to say that the secular nature of integrated education is far from um, the truth. And this bill doesn't do anything to take away from that um, law that's in place in Northern Ireland. Um, Mr Newton also talked about, and others talked about, sharing. I'm not opposed to sharing. This bill uses much of the language of the Shared Education Act. Um, I'm delighted that Mr Newton recognised the various education sectors and their work together in shared education. Having parental choice is not prevented by this bill. Instead, it allows parents to have a real choice for integrated education. The bill does not ask for a new team, as was indicated. Um, all that I've done is ask for resources for the existing Irish medium and integrated education team, some of whom have been deployed at times to shared education. Then we came to Mr Shane. Thank you very much, Pat. Um, Irish culture does need to be protected. Um, and you did say that you had a different perspective to Mervyn's story on that matter. Um, Structural inequalities existed outside the school system, and that is something that we all need to work on. That is something that we all need to do. School is not going to be the fix to our problems in Northern Ireland. We can use it as a stepping stone. Um, you talked about was there any evidence that integrated education works. Um, I just would like to go to... Um, so. I was thinking about what type of evidence that I could provide for you. Um, pupils at integrated schools have been found to have a more positive intergroup attitudes when compared with their peers at separate schools, and that comes from Hayes and McAllister 2009, Stringer et al. in 2009. Hayes and McAllister 2009 said that individuals who had attended an integrated school are significantly more likely to have friends and neighbours from across the religious divide, and that these friendships networks translate into a more optimistic view of future community relations. Baylock, Hughes, Wolf, Wilfer sorry, and Donnelly in 2018 said, while Northern Ireland strives to build a shared society, the current reality is that everyday experiences are still shaped by division along ethno-religious lines. This is particularly pronounced in the education system where more than 92% of pupils attend separate schools. Within the predominantly separate education system, however, exists a small collection of schools which cater to a more heterogeneous pupil body, apologies, I'm getting tired, and offer the opportunity for young people from both communities to meet and interact and potentially develop cross-group um, friendships. 
The present study compares the network-based cross-group cross friendships within two distinct ethos, yet they similarly enrol students from Catholic and Protestant backgrounds. Findings reveal that both schools show a high level of interconnection between pupils. However, the integrated school with an ethos that openly supports social cohesion shows a greater tendency towards cross-group interactions and best friendships than those found within separate school. In line with contact theory, these findings suggest that it may not be enough to simply create opportunities for intergroup contact, but that optimal conditions such as institutional support may be a prerequisite for positive relationships to flourish. Implications for educational policies designed to promote greater cross-community contact are then discussed in their paper. So there is some information, albeit there, we need to have much more. I would love to see, if we have an outcome-based system, more evidence of the outcomes actually being achieved as opposed to the outputs. Um, you, you talked about um, integrated schools and academic selection, and in some way this will come back to Mr Alistair's point. There are integrated schools who use academic selection. There are integrated schools who have a grammar stream. Integrated schools um, use that because of the term different abilities. Different abilities is not just about those who have vocational abilities or those who are special education needs, but it's also about those parents who wish to send their family to an integrated school who have high academic abilities. And therefore, this is why some integrated schools use academic selection. Personally, when I sent my child to an integrated school, she didn't need to have academic selection. She was able to enter without that. And my heart will be in my mouth at the start of August when I'm waiting for her A-level results to come through. It didn't stop her from having that academic um, pathway that she chose to go down. Um, you talked about integrated education being one of the lowest performing schools. Um, do you know what? I find this very difficult because what I find with integrated education is when you talk about differing abilities, you could have um, an integrated school where 35% of that school is comprised of people with special education needs. And those children uh, may, may absolutely um, achieve GCSEs or A-levels, but they may not. And it may be that their um, pathway in life is vocational. But even at that, pupils achieving three um, or more A-levels at A-star C at integrated schools um, is 25.6% and in non-integrated, non-grammar schools is 22.9%. It's there, there, slightly over there, thereabouts. That's the school census as a source. At five plus GCSEs, A star to C, integrated education, 51%, non-integrated, non-grammar schools, 52.3%. Slightly lower at GCSE, something for us to work on. Um, the promotion of integrated education and it has come forward that people are concerned that by growing integrated education or promoting integrated education, it will be bad for other sectors. Integrated education is turning away so many children at this stage. I have to ask when the House will ask, is, it, is the current system bad for integrated education? The Good Relations Report, as my colleague Chris Little had mentioned, has been showing for years the increased number of children being turned away from their first preference of post-primary schools. Um, it's up to 21% in the last recorded figures through 2018-2019. The current system is bad for integrated education at the moment. Um, promoting integrated education and enabling integrated education to have more children um, is good for integrated education. There are other schools, of course, that will see that as competition. Daniel McCrossan, thank you very much, Daniel, for your um, input today. You talked about um, we need to be more real and provide a viable option for parents. Thank you for that. To be honest, that's really what I'm about here. Um, you talked about the valuable contribution of all sectors and of shared education. And I would like to um, dispel a myth that's here today. I came through um, Maintain School. I had a fant and I've said it before in this house, I had a fantastic education through Maintain Schools. I'm never going to criticise that. I was never in a controlled school because I can't talk personally about that. I'm not here and through this bill to criticise any other sector. And I don't mention any other sector in the bill because all sectors do the best that they possibly can. 
And of course, shared education has been trying its very best. A lot of money has been put into it, a lot of schools have been involved in it, a lot of teachers have taken training. I'm not here to criticise that. But the fact that 7% of children attend integrated schools is because there's only space for 7% of children to be able to go to integrated schools. Um, you talked then as well about, Mr McCrossan, oh, you know, integrated education, you know, being, you didn't use the word stalled, but I'm going to use that at 7%. The growth since 1998, the year of Good Friday Agreement, has known that the number of pupils in integrated schools um, grew from um, 11,910 to 24,900 in 2021. Thus, the number of children in integrated schools has more than doubled, and the number of schools has increased by 24 since 1998. Each place in an integrated education school has been developed with parents and, with parents and for parents. The process involves the production of a development proposal, the collection of expression of interest forms, and the full process can take two to three years to conclude. Demand from parents is demonstrated by numerous parental surveys which show, and the Northern Ireland Life and Times is the most recent one that came out last week, that 69% of parents support their children being together in a mixed religion school. The March 2021 ARC research update, um, which draws on the 2019 Northern Ireland Life and Times survey, said then it was 61%, so you can see that it's growing. Almost a quarter um, of pupils applying for an integrated post-primary place in 1920 were unsuccessful. Not unsuccessful because they were turned away by the school, it's because they didn't have the space for them. So there's still a need for more places, but the process to fulfil demand, either through growing integrated schools or transforming schools, can be long and drawn out. So 7% is and does feel like it's stalled, but it's stalled because, unlike other schools, they're not getting that level of support. I certainly will. Um, any development proposal brought forward, uh, uh, two or three years, I don't recognise. A year, yes, possibly take a year to do it. But any development proposal brought forward for integrated education school that hasn't been fairly dealt with by the department is open to judicial review. I can think of one JR in my time uh, where my decision was overturned and then later a uh, court case uh, qualified that. Has there been any other cases where department's decisions have been overturned by JR? I'm aware of um, at least one that I'm in, I was involved with as a member of the Board of Governors of Strangford Integrated College where the school had applied for a development proposal and was turned down and got to the stage of writing the letter to say that they were about to take legal action and then the, the department um, reneged on that and went back on their decision. So I am aware that um, integrated schools have had to try to fight. The same school has asked for it to take on temporary variations, so I, I don't know why that can't be made more permanent. I will indeed. Member recall at the Education Committee, in my capacity as chair, I asked the then Education Minister Peter Weir um, if he was concerned that, he, that the decision taken in relation to Strangford Integrated College was going to be judicially reviewed, and the response I received was, we get judicially reviewed all the time. It's quite stark. Um, uh, it's a very true statement, but what does that mean? When I was Education Minister, I was JR'd by all sectors because we were entering a phase where there was, there was quite a significant number of development proposals coming through, particularly in relation to school closures. So I was JR'd, I would say, ten times during my time as Minister. So you have to put that into context. Ministers are JR'd a lot. It doesn't necessarily mean they're JR'd by the integrated sector. But the, the information I was trying to glean was, was there any legal evidence to suggest that the integrated sector was being discriminated against by the department? That's what I was trying to glean. Mr. Do, do you know what? I'm going to have to defer to research and bring that back to you because I, I personally think there is discrimination through area planning. But to be honest, that's only my position on that, um, I would need to go and look at that and bring it back for you, to be honest. I, I, I would rather not spoof and just give you the proper information. Um, Mr McCrossan had mentioned that SDLP does have concerns about the bill. It's not surprising. Um, I've, when I was speaking to parties, parties raised this with me. Um, this bill does not wish to close any other sector's schools 
I just want children and families who want to have their parental choice of an integrated school honoured. I am happy to work with members on the bill, and if it passes today, it will go to the Education Committee, where I am absolutely certain that members will take further evidence. Um, with respect to promotion, the Education Authority and CCMS lead on planning, and if integrated education is to be included, then both will need to consider integrated education and enable it or promote the provision of integrated education. Um, I would like as part of area planning for consideration for parental demands when planning the school's estate is put in place so that integrated schools, instead of having to be set up by parents outside the system, that the Education Authority, CCMS um, and the Department will consider integrated schools. Mr Butler, um, thank you very much for your input as well. Um, parental choice is absolutely important. Um, and educating children together is a component part of our peace process. It's not the only thing that's going to cause a solution, um, but it, it can have the opportunity to prove everything um, for society in general. Um, I know you said that it spoke unkindly about other sectors. I don't think it does, because um, especially in Clause 7, which so many people have talked about, that's why in Clause 7 it says the presumption would be there until, um, sorry, let me get the, the figure out, um, special circumstances. I haven't defined special circumstances, um, and that was advice by the drafter, who said that he felt that it would be better for the department and for the education bodies to consider those special circumstances. At the moment, for instance, when planning for the establishment of a new school, the department or the education authority could have a special education needs school because they say that there's a gap and, and we need to maybe provide places for special education needs children. That could be a special circumstance. But if I put in anything in special circumstances that defines that, then that takes away that um, flexibility from the department. So that's why the planner said putting in this section about new schools, um, would, uh, the flexibility would still be there. Now, I understand there be goes, this is making integrated education more superior to every other sector. Perhaps now everyone in this house will know what it feels like to actually be a parent of a child at an integrated school, because area planning doesn't plan for integrated schools. It doesn't. Does That's it yes, it will. Thank you. And, uh, thank you for addressing this point. Um, and my point on this is, um, when addressing issues, if it is a, an equality issue, how lifting one higher is the right thing to do. Surely we should be pulling people up to the same level. And I do accept. The, the feeling, perhaps, with, especially with parents and people who went to an integrated school, that there may not be a level playing field, but, but given that presumed uh, preference, then is equally unequal. I thank Mr. Butler for that. Um, I'll, I'll try to paint a picture in my mind. We'll have all seen the equity and the equality cartoon of people standing behind a fence in their three different heights, and if they're all provided with the same size of box, well, the shortest one, like me, still won't be able to see over the edge. But if you have an equitable treatment and you actually try to lift up the person who has less, who's shorter, um, then they actually get on a level playing field. Integrated education is so far behind all other sectors that we would need to actually do something proactively to take that forward. Um, clause 3, just to clarify, there are sectoral body support, CSSC, CCMS, the Education Authority, CNG, um, and NICE are all there, so there already is sectoral body support. Um, NICE is already funded. I'm putting it onto the face of this bill rather than policy. It's legislation that would enable um, support for that. Um, while we have various sectors, then I think the member agrees that we do have parental choice. But is that parental choice real when it comes to integrated education? Mr Weir, when he was here, he's not here at the moment, um, had said that it, I was providing a superior choice for integrated education. If that is the case then, why do we already have the presumption that controlled main schools will be provided for whenever new schools are being planned? Mr Storey then came forward um, and he talked about choice and about academic selection. That is not relevant for this bill because I don't um, deal with that in this. Um, context, he talked about the context of Northern Ireland and 100 years and, and potentially what could be coming for the future. Um, 
He claimed that this bill tried to bring the maintained sector under the controlled sector. It doesn't. I haven't mentioned that in any way, shape or form. Um, Mr um, Story talked about the many reports. And I have to say, if any of those reports had actually delivered for integrated education, then I wouldn't have needed to bring forward this legislation. Um, every other sector has failed. Mr Story said that. I don't believe that's true at all. Nobody says that any other sector has failed. And, and I really don't want anybody leaving this house for some reason thinking that um, somebody who grew up in a housing executive house went to, went to maintain schools, managed to do well in education, is sitting trying to make out that any other sector has failed. Of course they haven't. The other sectors have amazing teachers. They have been delivering education across Northern Ireland for years. I haven't said that, uh, that they have failed, and neither does the bill. So I'd, I'd rather put that to bed. Each sector has fantastic teachers. They have fantastic children. They may have wonderful academic results. They may have wonderful vocational courses. But as others have said, we have an education system that's just very complex. Trying to help one does not mean to say that I'm actually saying that there's anything wrong with the others. Reasonable numbers was brought up by Mr Story. Reasonable numbers is already um, set in legislation. It's in the Shared Education Act when it talks about the reasonable numbers of Protestants and Catholics. And to be honest, I'm glad that reasonable numbers is there. Um, over the years, we have had the 40-40-20, the 70-30. Um, reasonable numbers of Catholics and Protestants actually allows for those children across Northern Ireland who are of other faiths and of none to be included. Because up until now, quite a lot of the data that's collected is about Protestants and Catholics. We already see that in other parts of, of equality legislation. And to be honest, this is where the ETI inspection will come in. The ETI will be able to go into an integrated school to see if they actually are integrated. And it's more than just about the numbers of the children in school. As uh, Ms Bailey had talked about, it's about the curriculum, it's about the culture, it's about the sport, it's about the arts, it's about the teachers, it's about the board members, it's about all of that, as well as reasonable numbers. There was mention of Blackwater, and I'm glad someone, I can't remember who, Mr Story, I think, brought up Blackwater. Um, I'd actually love to invite Mr Story down to Blackwater. Um, Blackwater is a wonderful integrated school just outside Downpatrick. Um, a school that has certainly improved its numbers. It's on a site that will never allow the number of children to attend it that it needs to to be a sustainable school. Um, it's a school sitting with two mobile huts in the middle of it, one with the roof collapsed onto the floor that they can't move away because they can't get a crane in. Um, it is a lovely school and they are talking about closing to move into what hopefully will be a new school that's being paid for by the Integrated Education Fund and parents potentially in mid-down. So there's a process there because we do have an integrated school that doesn't have the full numbers, but it can't have it anyway because the site that it's on, to be honest, is very limited. Um, although I do absolutely love going to visit there. Um, when I talked about, um, in the bill, um, about the public services coming together, we have all in this house committed to cross-departmental working and collaboration. I don't quite understand what the concerns were about that. Ms Brogan, um, you recognised the aspirations of the bill. Thank you very much. Um, you wanted to work on the bill during the Education Committee. And do you know what? If that helps to improve this legislation and it helps to make it better for integrated education, um, I know in this bill I don't mention um, Irish medium. Um, I kept it very focused on integrated education, but if we can improve something that actually could help other sectors, then happy with that. Um, Mr Harvey, you talked about new decade, new approach, and I'm going to thank you, Mr Harvey, because I sat and I was trying to look around the house earlier to see who else was in the, in the programme for government negotiations and new decade, new approach, and there were representatives of different parties there. Um, the independent review of education I was told that if I got that into New Decade, New Approach, a civil servant would eat his hat. He still owes me that hat. This is something that I wanted. I made it very clear when I was sitting around that table in, in, in Stormont Castle that I had already started the independent education bill. The work had already begun on that. Um, and the long-term objectives would be the independent review of education. In fact, that little paragraph, that footnote that's in the appendix is by my hand. Um, but 
I made it very clear at that time, and there were no objections that the Integrated Education Bill would be an interim measure to bring integrated education up into a level playing field with other sectors. Um, you said that state grammar schools and controlled schools are open to everyone. They are. I'm not arguing about that. And I know I've spoke to Mr Stalford about this before. Um, I would rather that all schools had that integrated ethos. Not just that people can go in through the door, but when they go in through that door, they're not assimilated, but there is an integrated ethos there. So they don't be what that school is. And I have spoken to many pupils who have been to very, very good controlled schools that are mixed. And they tell me, I I'm, I'm, wasn't of the majority religion in that school. I wasn't celebrated. That's the difference with integrated and controlled schools. Amazing schools, amazing mixing, fantastic. We could do it, just do a wee bit more. You talked about parental choice. Where's the parental choice for integrated schools and integrated you know, parents that want to send their children there? In our constituency, Strangford College turns away a full year group of children. Our parental choice for integrated education is not there. The promotion of integrated education, I know you were sort of talking about the money side of that. Um, there already is money put into NICE to provide promotion for integrated schools. I have to say that um, it's only been in more recent times that NICE has been allowed to go in and talk to schools about transformation. Certainly after they've decided to transform, they've been doing that, but, but that promotion of transformation. And the Integrated Education Fund has actually been helping to fund NICE before that. Um, Personally, I think that the promotion of integrated education would help to remove the limitation on integrated education. We can finally see more than the 7%. Mr O'Dowd talked about integrated education has protection in law. I'm not going to tell a former Minister of Education how to suck eggs because he knows all about it. Um, he asked about NICE and the need for NICE. NICE does receive um, uh, certainly a, a large budget um, to encourage, facilitate and now to, um, to promote. Um, it's outside of, of um, the department. You talked about it being offensive, the definition of integrated education. In my opening statement earlier, I said that there would be many schools who could recognise and could say that that definition would suit them. However, the 89 order is not replaced by this bill. A school will still only be able to be called, legally called integrated a school um, if it's been through that order. So it, it means then that I add to what the 89 order says. So they've been through that process. They now come to be called an integrated school. There's a definition of who they are, and the ETI can then inspect it. It is not to be offensive about any other sector. In fact, as others have said, if any school couldn't say that that's what they provide, I would be astonished. Um, yeah, so just to say there, so it adds to the 89 order. I absolutely understand when you said about religion should be separate from education. That's bigger than this bill. And I know when I spoke to um, SDLP and they asked me about that, I went, I'm not going there because that is far beyond the integrated education. That is something that perhaps the independent review of education may well consider. Um, secularisation is certainly something that I got pressurised from the humanists to say if I would put that in the bill and I said no, this is about education and it's about integrated education. Is the legislation necessary whenever we've got the new decade, new approach commitment coming forward? I believe it is and the reason why I say I believe it is because it's been highlighted. Um, the independent review of integrated education is five years old. Some of the um, recommendations have certainly been taken forward. Thank you for that, to Mr. Weir, who, former Minister Weir. Um, but not all of it has been. And in fact, the clauses in this bill that are brought forward are some of the ones that were recommended that haven't been brought forward by the department. Um, Mr. O'Dowd then talked about identity is not neutral in integrated schools. I'm not going to argue with you on that. I believe that integrated schools have a job to do to ensure that they are fully inclusive for everyone. Um, and that's why I've included the ETI to inspect their ethos. Um, I agree with you. I have the experience of a, a wonderful integrated school that was inclusive, completely inclusive. When your daughter hurts another player on a hurley field, um, you sort of get a bit scared about that. So, um, yeah, um, just 
of hurling, yes, better than Gaelic. But um, yes, I come from a, an area where hurling is, is God. Um, but my daughter, I'll repeat that again, not Camogie, my daughter was playing hurling at the time and she hurt another youngster um, up at the Integrated Schools Cup, which is quite terrible. Mr McNulty, just when I'm talking about Gaelic games, um, oh, I, I, to be honest, hurling is in my lifeblood, so I, I can't say anything. Um, you said that you were surprised that integrated edu education has not grown. Um, it's hard to grow whenever it's so difficult to set up new schools and transformation is not easy. So parents, as Ms Bailey had talked about, have to mortgage their house. You know, they have to set up the school. Um, they have to bring forward development proposals. They have to self-finance for the first number of years before the department will recognise them. You don't have to do that for controlled or maintained schools. So it, it is a, an uphill battle. Um, you're absolutely right when you said young people are light years ahead of us. Um, I can now say it in this, well, I have declared it before, but my daughter was involved with SUNY, the SSUNI, the Secondary Schools Union, Northern Ireland. Those young people terrify me because they will probably be sitting in this house and in the next 10 to 15 years. Um, and they are light years ahead of us. You asked a very important, que a key question, which was how do we measure success of education of our young people? And I find this some of the, the hardest, this would be a very hard question for me to answer because I, many people will know I'm in the all party group for disability and I have been to various schools um, looking after young people with special education needs and you could have a young person in a class who all of a sudden can pay attention for an hour and that is an amazing achievement for that young person, that another young person could actually get to the stage where they have completed five GCSEs, and that's an amazing achievement. We then have secondary schools, and we have, I was talked about earlier, the, the number of GCSEs that they achieve, and that could be just the best thing that person could achieve. And then we have grammar schools who achieve these wonderful um, exam results. So how do we measure the success of education of young people? And this comes back to if we're going to measure academic grades, then there are some schools who will be wonderful. If you measure how successful are the change in a child from the day they enter the school until the day they leave, that could be another measurement. It's a very difficult one. I don't believe that academic, academic grades are the only way that we can measure the success of a school. I would rather see a teacher's report who says that, you know, Johnny sitting in the corner there um, was an absolute pain whenever he came in through the door, but all of a sudden we've got him to the stage where he's passed his maths GCSE, he's passed his English GCSE, and you know what? We've actually got him a vocational qualification and he's gonna be working as a joiner. You know, that could be amazing. Um, You'd raised concern about faith-based schools. Now I'm a great believer in faith-based schools. And that's why I chose integrated education for my daughter, because it is a faith-based school. It happens to be all faiths. Um, all schools in Northern Ireland are faith-based schools. All schools in Northern Ireland are required to have a Christian ethos. Um, religious education is a compulsory school subject. Article 5.1 of the Education Reform 1989 stipulates that every grant-aided school will include provision for religious education for all registered pupils at the school. Integrated education follows that as well. You've said the bill is the start, and I have to say I agree with you. It has opened a conversation. It has opened the ability, I think, for some of us to come across from our parties and to say, what do we want to happen? It's not the end. And I know that if this goes through to the Education Committee, it definitely won't be the end. There'll be a lot of discussions going on. And I fully expect the Education Committee to have to extend the time that you want your um, external people to come in and give witness to you. Um, Mr Little, you outlined the findings of the many reports that have happened for years that have defined the need for integrated education. You outlined the significant cost for our current education system a system that we all know is under huge financial strain. Um, you highlight the increasing oversubscription in integrated schools and the Good Relations Indicator report where 21% of children um, who had put down integrated education for first preference were, were unable to get a place at an integrated school. Um, you talked about the independent review of education, that some of the recommendations have gone forward and others have not. Um, Mr. Stalford at that stage then had come in um, and talked about, you know, 
giving preference to integrated education, and I respond with that the same way as I'd respond to Mr Butler by saying, if we are not just talking about equality but equity, then it's only right and proper that we do support a sector that doesn't have the same level of support as other sectors. Mr Weir then came forward and he rightly talked about the quality of education rather than sectoral. Of course people want to send their children to a good school, absolutely want to send a, ch a child to a good school, but what some of us consider to be good schools is not just academic, but it's about the holistic nature of the school and the ethos of the school. Um, the quality of integrated education is all children, including the high number of mainstreamed special education needs pupils, are all together in the one place. You discussed the strategic review of education. You questioned Clause 7 in the special circumstances. You asked why not wait until the independent review for education comes forward before bringing this bill forward. Inter integrated education can't wait. And to be honest, this debate will probably go forward to the independent review of education to give an outline of what parties think about um, potentially a single education system. It has been five years since the independent review of integrated education. I believe absolutely in strategic reform, but I do not believe that parental choice is being provided for now for integrated schools. I know you accused me of ha having muddled thinking. Um, I, I'm not going to go down that road too much. I had an amazing drafter who was able to go through word by word with me. Um, I'm just disappointed that a former education minister wants this most this House to vote against parental choice for integrated education and legislation trying to improve upon that. Christopher Stolford said quite a number of things that I can absolutely agree with and in fact in this House on other occasions I have stood up and said that I agree with Christopher on a number of things which will probably get me discipline from the Alliance Party but um, children should be educated together. I want more than that. I want an integrated ethos where, chil where children are integrated together not assimilated. The review of education the independent review of education, as, as I said in my initial speech, is going to be like Bengoa. It is going to take years and years to implement. And in the meantime, as I said, during the new decade, new approach negotiations, the integrated education bill will help integrated education move forward. I will absolutely give you my absolute confirmation now on behalf of the Alliance Party that we will give the Education Minister full support for the delivery of the independent review. Why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we? We wrote it, we put it into New Decade, New Approach. Um, I know that Mr Stolford had said that he is a religious person and his religion was not through school, but it was through home. I agree with him. I would rather see religion outside of school, but it's bigger than this bill. It's not something that I'm going to do. I'm not going to take religion out of schools um, because to be honest, that really would kill this bill. Mr O'Toole, 7% can be educated together. More want to, but they can't. Um, he did confirm that schools, sectoral bodies and teachers are wonderful. Not arguing with them, they absolutely are. That's why I'm in this house and not a teacher. I don't know how teachers do it. Um, he did talk about the education system being at fault and it needs to be improved. Absolutely agree with that, and that's why we have the independent review of education coming forward. He talked about an incoherent educational system. Reform will take time, and if we have the opportunity to tackle division, why wouldn't we do it now? He understands that this bill and discussing education gets to who people, to, about people and who they are and their identity. He did ask something that I don't think I'd be able to answer, which is the ways in which we can celebrate each other and ourselves for those who are unable or don't go to an integrated school. Um, that's something that I would love to see more of, whether that's through this assembly and through the work of this assembly or local councils. I think that there is more to celebrate um, through our diversity than there is to keep it separate, but that's perhaps for a different occasion, not this bill. I'd like to thank Ms Bailey and the Green Party for their support. Um, she confirmed that this bill predated New Decade, New Approach. She confirmed the current education system is in trouble. She discussed the department's appointments to um, GMI boards, which I wasn't aware of and I will have to look into. So thank you for that, Ms Bailey. Um, she said that if we could start education again, we wouldn't have the current system that we have. 
but recognised we cannot start from scratch. We already have a system, and that this bill helps to bring forward part of that system now. Parental choice led to um, Irish medium and to the integrated education sector. And she recognised that not all parents have a choice. Many only have one choice in their area. And sometimes the choice for integrated education is full. I confirm that in many parts of Northern Ireland there is no integrated education um, or integrated school that parents can choose. Where there is an integrated school in some areas, like mine, the post-primary is completely oversubscribed. I know that uh, Ms Bailey has said that she would prefer the difference where faith would be taken out of schools, but at this stage all schools are faith schools. Um, and she rightly said, and actually it, it, it really touched my heart because this is why I got involved in integrated education, integrated schools are more than about the pupil numbers. It is about the curriculum. It's about the culture. It's about the sport. It's about the arts. It's all about ethos. All about ethos. And Mr O'Toole then mentioned that as well. Integrated ethos is something that not everyone understands. And I just hope that perhaps through this bill and this discussion that some more understanding of what an integrated ethos is can be shared across the House. Mr Alistair said that this was a, term, a determined assault on academic selection um, because I've mentioned the terms different abilities. I haven't said all abilities. It's disappointing Mr Alistair isn't here. But um, to be honest, I would rather see academic selection out of schools. I, I, that's not anything to be hidden. However, because I took in-depth consultation and I listened to people, I didn't do that because integrated schools are not against selection. Lagan College has a grammar stream. Strangford College had a development proposal for a grammar stream. That's turned down. It may be going back in again. And as I say, I may well not want to have transfer tests done, but this bill accepts that in including different abilities, some integrated schools have a grammar stream. And that's it. So I have included that in this. I'm sorry Mr Alistair isn't here that I could address that with him, but um, this bill is not going to get rid of transfer tests. Um, integrated schools have told me some of them want them, some of them don't. But for this, this um, definition or meaning of integrated education, it talks about differing abilities. And that's not just about those who have vocational outlook in life or special education needs, but there are those of us who have children who are academic gifted but we still want them to go to an integrated school and not to a grammar school. Mr Carroll talked about people before profit say that they would prefer secular education. I respect that. Um, and you said that you would support the bill going forward, that you're happy to promote and resource integrated education. You did talk about financial efficiency, and that's, I have to admit that it's not what this bill's about, is closing other schools to promote integrated education. We would much rather see um, schools coming together, you know, that natural amalgamation, the mixing, as others have talked about. Um, financial efficiency happens to be one of the things that a lot of reports bring forward when they talk about integrated schools and mixing of schools together. You don't need to have separate, separate schools, but in the system that we currently have, we have various sectors, parents have choice, so financial efficiency is talked about. It's something that could be achieved in the future. But for this bill, it's, it's not going to take away the other sectors. The minister then um, confirmed that children being educated separately is, is something that we have at this stage and that the education system is complex. Um, she talked about the reference to benign apartheid. Um, she talked also about natural integration happens in some schools, and she mentioned Methody. Absolutely, it does. Supermix schools are available across Northern Ireland, and there are many wonderful supermix schools. I will bring it back to Judge Tracy to say that integrated schools are a standalone concept. And while people can use the word integration, if they want to be integrated, there's a process to follow. And I would absolutely welcome somebody like Methody coming forward because they could do it so easily. Um, the plan that is needed going forward for our education is the independent review of education. So I'm absolutely delighted that after those negotiations and new decade, new approach that DUP have got on board. Um, there has been absolutely significant investment in education. It is really expensive. But our children, you know, of course we're going to spend money on our health and our children. Um, 
She talked about support for shared education. Absolutely, shared education is helping to break down barriers. Um, I support sharing, and it's a pity that the Fermanagh Trust model of shared education was not implemented. Um, the Fermanagh Trust model, um, I met those people, my goodness, it's so long ago, um, where they talked about the bringing together of schools, and rather than it being a top-down approach, which they felt, unfortunately, shared education was, they wanted a ground-up approach, where they would start off with their schools by sharing the best teacher in maths would teach maths across the campuses. The best teacher in English would teach English across the campuses. Then they would start sharing together um, things like stationery, the costs for stationery. And then it would naturally evolve into an integrated state where the, the, the community and the schools would come together. It would have been lovely if that had been the model, but um, that unfortunately wasn't able to go forward all those years ago. Um, as I said, new decade, new approach. It was a hard negotiation. Um, and as I said earlier, uh, um, there is a civil servant who, if he happens to get wind of this debate, knows that he owes me a hat that he's supposed to be eating. Um, we got that independent review of education into that agreement. It was made very clear during those negotiations that it would be more than Bengoa, and it was likely to cause the most difficulty for this assembly compared to health because everyone has a vested interest. As was discussed earlier, I think it was Mr O'Toole had mentioned, um, that it, our education system reflects our identity. Um, I know that the minister had mentioned about what does this bill cover. Nursery, as far as I'm concerned, is non-sectoral. It's outside of this. Um, it may well be the 40th anniversary of integrated education, but this bill was held back because the assembly was collapsed. Um, if I had had the opportunity to bring this bill forward three years ago, I would have done it then. Um, believe me, leaving it to the last day before recess to get it in so we might manage to get it through um, before the end of this mandate wasn't my plan. Um, the department certainly does fund NICI, but, you, but the department has only recently allowed NICI to promote transformation as an option for schools. Um, I do believe that parents who want to send their children to integrated education don't have a choice. And when the minister talked about you know, placing other um, sectors above, or placing integrated education, apologies, above other sectors, I think that's what the department already does, that integrated education, by the fact that parents don't have a choice, that's the proof that says that integrated education remains at 7% because it suits the department to be that way. Um, the Good Relations Report, as was said earlier, 2018-2019, confirms 21% of children who do not get accepted to their first choice of an integrated school and are turned away. There's absolutely no data held by the department to say where those children end up going to. So if there's any commitment to supporting all the sectors equally, how come you can do that with maintained and controlled, but you don't do it for integrated education? The data is missing. Um, the community conversation that has already come forward and has been used by the Education Authority gives the community a voice. The current system does use the religious demographics of an area and empty desks when there's a planning of a new school. Community conversation turns that round and actually says to the community, what is it that you want? And there have been very successful community conversations that have happened so far. What I would say to the House in, in closing is, the end, or getting close to closing, Deputy Speaker, um, the independent review of education is to look at a single education system. And this House is in trouble. Because where's the parental choice that was discussed by so many here, if that happens? Not every sector has a fair and equal voice. If they did, we wouldn't have 20% of 21% of children being turned away from their choice. I haven't diluted what integrated education is because the requirement of the 89 order stands. I've checked this legally. I checked up the drafter. I've checked up our bills office. I do, the only thing I'm changing in the 89 order is promote. Um, so I don't see how that's, that's possible. Um, I want to thank you, Mr. or Deputy Speaker, um, for your patience. I really do appreciate all the comments brought forward today. When I met with parties, I confirmed that while I'm passionate about integrated education, I want to ensure legislation brought forward is good and inclusive. I would like to thank the Bills Office the whole team who have all helped get this bill to the second stage. I'd also like to pay tribute again to Fiona McAteer and the team who worked behind the scenes with me and helping me. Um, it has been 
a very um, in-depth look at integrated education. It feels like my baby, and I hope you will allow my baby to take its next steps, and the Education Committee will look after it for me. I would ask each of you to vote to allow the Integrated Education Bill to pass to second stage. Everyone gets to participate in integrated education. No one gets to dominate. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, the question is that the second stage of the Integrated Education Bill be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. Okay, clear the lobbies. The question will be put in three minutes. I would remind you that we should continue to uphold social distancing and that members who have proxy voting arrangements in place should not come into the chamber. Thank you. Okay, members, if members would resume their seats, please. Uh, before I put the question, I would again uh, remind those members present that, if possible, it would be preferable if we could avoid a division. The question is that the second stage of the Integrated Education Bill be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. No. Do we have tellers?
Okay, members, uh, tellers have been appointed as follows. Tellers for the eyes are Chris Little and Claire Bailey. Tellers for the nose are Peter Weir and Harry Harvey. Before the Assembly divides, I want to remind you that, as per Standing Order 112, the Assembly currently has proxy voting arrangements in place. <clears throat> members who have authorised another member to vote on their behalf are not entitled to vote in person and should not enter the lobbies. I remind all members of the requirement for social distancing while the division takes place, and I ask you to ensure that you retain at least a two-metre gap between yourselves and the other person when moving around in the chamber or the rotunda, and especially in the lobbies. Please be patient at all times, observe the signage, and follow the instructions of the lobby clerks. Clear the lobbies. The Assembly will divide. Eyes to my right and nose to my left.
Secure the doors, please.
Members, if please resume your seats. And um, I'd ask the clerk to read the result, please. All right, Jim. 83 members voted, 56 members voted aye, 27, 27 members voted no. The second stage is agreed. As member, the second stage is agreed, and that concludes the second stage of the Integrated Education Bill. The bill stands referred now to the Committee for Education. Thank you. And the, the next and final item on the order paper is the adjournment. The question is that the Assembly do now adjourn. The Assembly is adjourned. Thank you. Slana Walia, CFO. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary.